Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. I'm very thankful to be on today. And I just want to thank all of you for your patience, especially since yesterday was the original plan for the stream. But unfortunately, uh, my camera guy was unable to make the live stream work, but we recorded other things and you'll see those later. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, my case for the papacy from the new Eliakim typology. And I'll do it from the comfort of uh, the new house that I'm in and including, you know, the setup that I have now. Doesn't look all too different from what I had before, but I'm thankful that, you know, God has been good to my family and we've been able to move to a new place. So um, let me just say from the outset that I'm not going to be looking at the live chat. And so I hope that you guys will be civil. You know, Jesus is watching. So please be respectful. Um, and also, I'm going to deal with objections and questions on another stream. Today, what I'm going to focus on is just presenting the arguments for the new Eliakim typology and its relationship to the papacy. This is going to be a long stream. This is kind of like my definitive presentation on all the research that I've done on this argument. The PowerPoint that I'm presenting is over 100 slides. And so, I mean, buckle in, get ready, and enjoy this presentation. I poured my heart and my soul into doing this research, and I'm very thankful um, for all the people who have supported me. And so let me add the PowerPoint to the stream and let me get started. Let me see. All right. And I hope that everybody can see uh, the PowerPoint clearly. Let me actually go onto YouTube really quick and just check to see that the PowerPoint uh, is appearing properly. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, I'm also going to you know, be thanking various people. And so I'll allow time for people to trickle in. So let me see, I'm trying to pull it up on my phone to make sure it is appearing properly. My phone is being a little bit slow. Um, okay, so I'm actually gonna look into the chat now. Uh, can everybody see the PowerPoint clearly and am I on screen or off screen now? Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so everybody can see. All right, there we go. All right, I see what it looks like on the uh, on the screen, so I can continue my presentation. So, um, yes, today I'm presenting the new Eliakim typological argument for the papacy. Let me begin by thanking um, Saint John of Cologne. He's played a huge part in kind of giving me the inspiration and courage that I needed to present today, and he's also a fellow Dominican. He was martyred for his refusal to recant the doctrine of transubstantiation and papal supremacy. Let me also thank uh, Daniel Vecchio, who has been a huge source of encouragement and also um, given patristic citations for the Isaiah 22, Matthew 16, 19 parallel and um, other citations throughout the history of the church. Let me also thank Joe Schmid. Um, so Joe Schmid helped me formulate the argument in a nice, rigorous way. So he didn't do any of the exegetical work or compiling the research, but Joe has been a good friend of mine and he helped me put it in premise, premise, conclusion format. And so I want to thank Joe for that. Um, Seraphim Hamilton, who expanded my view on the Old Testament and especially um, his arguments about the relationship between the temple and the government of ancient Israel played a huge part in my thinking. Let me also thank Scott Hahn for his encouragement. And also, you know, he gave me a shout out on Pints with Aquinas when he was with Cameron Bertuzzi and Matt Frad. Um, saying he wished that me and Jimmy Aiken were there. I'm so honored that Scott would say that. Um, and also Scott helped me look into some of the possible patristic or at least earlier citations of the Isaiah 22 allusion uh, in Matthew 16. Let me also thank Matt Frad, who kind of got me mainstreamed on this particular argument and has always been a huge source of friendship and building me up. My Catholic Answers family, um, Trent Horn, John Sorensen, and so many others who have played a part in encouraging me. And I actually want to thank Gavin Ortland as well. And I'm not being kind of snarky with this one. I actually think what Gavin has done with his arguments and his objections is he's helped me go back to the drawing board and fine tune the argument and make it as strong as possible. And also Gavin's been a good friend of mine and we've always had good engagements. Um, and now throughout the presentation, I am going to mention Gavin quite a bit. And the reason why is not because, you know, I have an ax to grind with him. But it's because Gavin has been the most public critic of my argument and the um, way that I formulated it. And so Gavin obviously is going to be my main interlocutor. Um, and so that's it's not meant to be personal at all. And um, Gavin and I are good friends. And, you know, so I think, you know, I hope people understand. All right. So here's the argument. 
So I've divided up into three phases, but let me just explain the premises in turn, right? So phase one, textual illusion. There is a textual illusion between Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19. Phase two is establishing the typology. Two, the best explanation for the textual illusion is either A, a Jesus Eliakim typology, B, the similar function of the keys, or C, a Peter Eliakim typology. Three, the best explanation is not A to B, therefore the best explanation is C. If the best explanation is C, then the textual illusion is probably a Peter Eliakim typology. Six, so the textual illusion is probably a Peter Eliakim typology. Uh, phase three, then, then to the papacy. But the textual illusions being a Peter Eliakim typology is much more expected on the hypothesis that the papacy is true than on its negation. Premise eight, if the textual illusion is probably a Peter Eliakim typology, and this is much more expected on the papacy hypothesis than on its negation, then the textual illusion strongly favors the papacy hypothesis over its negation. Now, I just want to make a few comments here about the argument. So, for example, um, Joe pointed out that we can't conclude in premise eight that the papacy is definitely a uh, hypothesis is definitely more true than false because we didn't include the initial probability. Um, this argument is kind of fra is framed in a Bayesian format. And so you would have to also include the initial probability and then assess whether or not this argument can overcome any barriers in the initial probability. Now, I think based on, you know, Cameron Bertuzzi's research, the initial probability is not going to be less than 0.5. Um, it, might, it might be 0.5 or even above, but I think there's good initial grounds for believing, okay, God would establish an office like the papacy in the first place. And then what this argument does is supplement it with that initial probability. I think it gets us all the way home. Uh, the other thing too, is that I formulate the argument in this way so that um, before what I did was I kind of, you know, put a bunch of similarities and textual illusions and, you know, clustered them all together. And that ended up kind of making the argument that I was presenting sloppy. And it made me stumble and even say that, oh, scholars agree that there's a typology when in reality they agree on a textual illusion, which Gavin has very helpfully pointed out. And so this argument actually helps me reorganize a lot of those um, pieces of evidence so that it's not sloppy. It's very precisely fine-tuned, and it focuses on what needs to be defended in each of the parts. So, for example, textual illusion. Is there one or is there not? Okay, if there is, then why is there a textual illusion in Matthew? And then what this, what this does is it forces the opponent of the um, you know, Catholic interpretation to offer their own interpretation of why there is a textual illusion. And in turn, then, that's when I think the case for the Peter Oliakim typology comes out strongest. All right, so let me explain what I mean by the papacy hypothesis, right? So the papacy hypothesis is simply the following. Christ established a successional Roman Petrine oh, office or ministry that is supreme and infallible. All right, so obviously Christ is being the one who's establishing it. The office is successional. It's Roman. It's based in Rome. It's Petrine. It's based on the person of Peter. It's an office or ministry, so it's related to the um, ecclesiology of the church, or it's related to ecclesiology. It's supreme in the sense that it is an immediate, ordinary power. Um, it's a power that the Pope has over all of the bishops. There's a superiority that he contains within himself. Universal jurisdiction is contained in this idea and other things. And then obviously it's infallible in the sense that the Pope can not only on his own, um, speaking the mind of the church, speak ex cathedra, but that he'll be protected from error in his definitive teachings. So um, the scriptural citation that I'm going to begin with is Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19. This is the core. These are the two core verses, right? So let me just read them. Isaiah 22, 22. Then I will put the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus speaking to Peter, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now, my only issue with the NASB is that in the original Greek, it's the kingdom of heaven, of the heavens. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in the heavens. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in the heavens. Um, you know, early church fathers like Origen noted the fact that in the Greek of Matthew 16, 19, Peter binds and looses in the plural heavens. Whereas in 1818 with Peter and all the apostles together, it's in the singular heaven. Now, 
I don't know if there's any significance between the, uh, you know, the difference of why Matthew uses one or the other. Jonathan Pennington has done a study on this, um, and he argues that there is a slight distinction. But for the most part, it's not going to be anything terribly different. But that will be relevant later on, which is why I mention it. So premise one, there is a textual illusion between Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19. Um, so I'm going to use the textual illusion standard of Richard Hayes. And so I have a quote here by G.K. Beale in the Handbook of the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. He writes this, quote, probably the most referred to criteria for validating illusions is that offered by Richard Hayes. And I include the citations for where Hayes lays out the, the, uh, these standards. And what I want to show with this is, look, there is actually a methodology in scholarship for identifying scriptural or textual illusions. Um, and the seven are listed on the side. Now, I want to also mention up from the outset, some people will say, well, OK, Swan, I agree that there's intertextuality, right, but not textual illusion. Well, the point is that even with intertextuality, you can have different kinds, right? So, for example, there's the notion of uh, coincidental intertextuality, where it's just this idea that, OK, two texts seem to coincidentally align with each other, have similarities. Then there is obligatory intertextuality, which is what I'm arguing is going on here via the textual illusion uh, principles and standards offered by Hayes. And so e even if you want to frame it as intertextuality, I'm just going to, you know, um, change maybe the, the the dictionary a little bit for to adjust to your terminology and say, okay, then it's an obligatory intertextual illusion. So these are the seven standards. And, and what I'm going to do is explain each of them and then show after each explanation why it works in the case of Isaiah and Matthew. Okay, so premise one, availability. Okay, so availability is the first of the seven standards. Here's what Beale writes on page 33 of his book. The source text, the Greek or Hebrew Old Testament, must be available to the writer. The writer would have expected his audience on a first or subsequent reading to recognize the intended allusion. It's important that if I'm saying that, let's say, Matthew is making allusion back to Isaiah, that at least the text that he's using um, uh, for the Old Testament would actually, you know, align at least with how he's using um, the, the purported text in the New Testament. Now, I should also mention from the outset, too, that Richard Hayes formulated his argument for textual allusions um, for, for uh, the Pauline epistles. But the, uh, the, the standards that Hayes has used have been expanded beyond Paul into other kinds of textual allusions. And I'll go into more detail later on maybe the limits to some extent of Hayes' methodology. But for the most part, I think it's airtight. So when we look at the different translations of Isaiah 22, um, we have, for instance, the great Isaiah scroll, which was discovered with the other Dead Sea Scrolls. And I'm using the Fred P. Miller translation. Um, now, the, the dates on the Isaiah, great Isaiah scroll kind of vary from 356 to 100 BC. But the point that I want to say here is that this manuscript that we have, right, is incredibly early uh, for the Hebrew text of Isaiah, right? And so obviously it says, and I'll give him the key of the house of David upon his shoulder, and he will open and no one shall shut. And, uh, oh, sorry, that might be a typo. And, and no one will, and what he opens, no one will uh, open. It might be a typo. Sorry, I apologize. Um, now, other people have said, why not the Septuagint, right? And so one thing that I noticed is that there are certain versions of the Septuagint that contain the key of David and other versions of the Septuagint that don't. If you go with, for instance, the Brenton translation published by Hendrickson, it's going to have both the glory of David and then after the glory of David, there's the key of the house of David and whatever he opens, no one shall shut. Whatever he shuts, no one shall open. Um, so what I want to say here is that at least given contemporary scholarship, um, especially, you know, in Moises Silva's translation of um, Isaiah 22 from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament um, in, in published by Oxford University Press, um, the best manuscripts that we have of the Septuagint only contain the glory of David. They don't contain the keys. Um, the argument of scholars is that the key of the of David was later added into the Septuagint because I guess the uh, you know the people who had received the Septuagint thought it was kind of weird. Like, why does it say glory of David in Isaiah 22 of the Septuagint, but in the Masoretic or the Hebrew text, 
it contains the key of David. And so they kind of sandwiched it together. And so later translations will have, you know, both together, but the early, at least the best manuscripts that we have uh, among contemporary scholars, uh, they would argue that it contains only the glory of David. So it makes it harder than to establish that uh, Matthew, or at least Jesus speaking in Matthew, was having the Septuagint in the back of his mind. Now, we do have then the um, Isaiah Targum of the second century. That's when it's dated, but the earliest manuscript that we have, I think, comes from the sixth to the tenth century around there. So, it's, or actually, never mind, that's the Masoretic. But uh, the best manuscripts that we have of the Isaiah Targum come much later, although it's dated to the second century. So, this is Bruce Chilton's translation, you know, and I will place the key of the sanctuary and the authority of the house of David in his hand, and he will open and none shall shut, and he will shut and none shall open. Okay, now the Masoretic text, obviously um, formulated from the 6th to the 10th century, um, and this is the JPS 1917 Tanakh translation, um, and this is usually the one that you see in just, you know, NASB and other translations, and I will give the key of the house of David on his shoulder, and he shall open and no one shall close, and he shall close and no one shall open. The question before us now is when Matthew uses, if Matthew uses Isaiah 22 in uh, in 1619, which version of Isaiah was he using? Well, I think we have a clue in the fact that we know Jesus spoke Matthew 16, 17 to 19 in Aramaic. As Anthony J. Salterini points out in the Erdman's commentary on the Bible, quote, this blessing and promise to Peter appears only in Matthew verses 17 to 18. But the Aramaic influences on the language of the passage make it uh, probable that it derives from an earlier tradition, or early tradition of the Jesus community. The Greek of Matthew contains a transliteration of Simon's Aramaic name, Simon Bar Jonah, and uses the Semitic idiom flesh and blood for human. So given then the fact that Jesus uses Aramaic to describe Simon Bar Jonah, Bar Jonah being, you know, Aramaic for son of Jonah, if it was Hebrew, it'd be Ben Jonah. Um, and then even the Semitic idiom of flesh and blood for human, we see that, okay, Jesus spoke 6, 17 and 19 in Aramaic. Um, there's a strong likelihood maybe Hebrew was used as well since we have a Semitic idiom. Or at least, you know, since he, uh, since uh, Aramaic is a dialect of Hebrew, right? Both are kind of in the, in play for being a possible background on what I, what version of Isaiah Jesus was using. So, what I'll say is this, Jesus' phrase appears to more closely align with the Hebrew text of Isaiah, at least the way that he is allegedly using it in 1619. He says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He only mentions one kingdom. He doesn't mention the sanctuary um, in addition, which is what we would expect if maybe he was using something like the Targum of Jonathan or a precursor to the Targum of Jonathan. Um, but regardless, since Jesus does not quote Isaiah 22, 22 verbatim, we can't locate the precise source. It's either going to be the Hebrew or the Aramaic. Now, given the fact that Jesus only mentions the kingdom and not the sanctuary, or maybe he combines the two together, who knows? It's either going to be the Hebrew or the Aramaic. I side with the uh, maybe Jesus was raised on the Hebrew text of Isaiah, since we have a good manuscript tradition for that. BC probably would have carried into the first century. But regardless, this text was available to Jesus in such a way that he could have made the illusion, especially given the language that he was using um, of Aramaic, a dialect of Hebrew. Now, the second thing that we can then go to is volume, right? So by volume, uh, Richard Hayes means three different things. So the first is repetition. The primary factor is the degree of verbatim repetition of words and syntactical patterns. Um, the second is precursor. Right. So volume also depends, however, on the distinctiveness, prominence or popular familiarity of the precursor text. So, for example, like let's say that, um, you know, he gives the example of when Paul uses in First Corinthians 8, 6, for there is one God and one Lord. And this is an allusion back to the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4, right, where it says, you know, behold, behold, you're, you know, Israel, your God is one. Right. So there is this idea that if the precursor text is strong enough, where if you only cite a few words, but everybody knows what you're talking about, then that gives a strong indication that in the um, in the new text or in the text that is alluding back to the original text, that that is what it's doing. So for example, if I say something like, 
four score and seven years ago, you know that I'm talking about the Gettysburg Address. Or if I say our father, right, you know I'm talking about the Lord's Prayer, right? So if there's something like this going on, that can strengthen the idea that there is an illusion going on. The final thing is rhetoric. And I believe this is mentioned by Hayes um, in, in the 2005 book, Conversion of the Imagination. He says, finally, the volume of an echo is affected sub, uh, subtly by the rhetorical stress placed upon the phrases in question, both within the precursor text and in Paul's discourse or simply the later text, right? So, for example, if in the text of Genesis 1, 3 to 5, I believe it mentions, you know, light being created, right? Well, and then in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, we see light being mentioned once again. If the same rhetorical stress is being used in the old text and in the new text, then that probably means that Paul intends to use the precursor text because it has the same rhetorical use. And so it would fit the rhetorical use of the later text, right? So for example, let's suppose that in the Old Testament, I have something like, um, you know, there's this grand uh, reveal of the son of man, right? And let's say in the New Testament, there's a moment where, you know, for example, you know, you know, Jesus says, you'll see the son of man riding on the clouds of heaven, right? Obviously a, an allusion to Daniel seven, but in both contexts is this kind of grand rhetorical reveal of the son of man, which occurs obviously in Mark's gospel when Jesus is before the Sanhedrin, there's a similar rhetorical stress. So that might also increase the probability that there is a textual allusion um, in both contexts. Okay. So, and, you know, um, just to give another example uh, of how a textual illusion might work, for example, in terms of repetition under volume, you know, you might see similar Greek words being used or similar words being used in both passages, um, or even the similar themes. Like, for example, Hayes points out that in Romans 8, 33 to 34, you know, it has this idea, Paul has this idea of justification followed by condemnation. And then when you go back to Isaiah 50, uh, verse 8, where uh, Hayes is, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, Hayes is arguing there's this illusion. You see, likewise, not only similar Greek words, but actually similar themes of, you know, um, you know, justification, and then also who contends with me, who confronts me, who judges me, right? So Hayes is arguing that that's a way in which uh, volume can be used to establish an illusion. Okay, so I want to be fair here and say that Hayes intends that both be present, not only the verbatim repetition of words or certain words, um, but also syntactical patterns. Now, the thing that we have to admit is that in, in Matthew 16, 19, there is barely any verbatim repetition of Isaiah 22, 22. Um, none of the words are repeated verbatim, um, except maybe and, right? And that's it. Um but we see a strong syntactical correspondence between both passages, and I've laid out what the syntactical correspondences are. Let me first just read what it is without the notes that I've added, right? So God will give keys or key, uh, key or keys of kingdom to man whose authority is exercised in a definitive and contrastive manner, okay? So now let's look at what it is in particular, put the meat on the bones. So obviously, in both passages, you have God, okay, speaking, at least, you know, Isaiah is speaking for God, or God is speaking through Isaiah. But in, in both contexts, it's God speaking in the first person, right? Where in Isaiah 22, you know, the uh, the office of Shebna, uh, Shebna is being deposed and being replaced with Eliakim. And then God speaking through Isaiah to, uh, to Shebna is saying, I will give the key, right, um, you know, speaking of Eliakim, he says, you know, I will give the key of the house of David. Okay, so Jesus says, I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Both times God is speaking in the first person. Both times it's also future tense. Eliakim, it, you know, says that I will give the key of the house of David, future tense. Or Jesus says, I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, future tense both times. Now you do have key and keys uh, you know, you have a variation of that in both passages. I'm going to go into more detail why it doesn't matter that one is singular and one is plural. Um, and then kingdom, right? So you have the house of David and you have the kingdom of heaven. And they're given to a man, Eliakim in Isaiah, Peter in Matthew, whose authority is exercised in a definitive way. So no one shall in Isaiah. And Jesus says in heaven in Matthew, 
And also the use of this authority or the authority itself is contrastive, right? So in Isaiah, it's open shut. In Matthew, it's bind loose. So we have strong syntactical correspondences between both passages. Now, what I want to say here is that I think Richard Hay's work is a useful starting point, right? And we should only differ from it if given sufficiently good reason. So Hayes wants us to both have verb, uh, at least some verbatim repetition of words and syntactical correspondence. But I'm going to argue here for three reasons that um, there's still a, a good reason to affirm repetition in the case of Matthew and Isaiah. The first is that Jesus will sometimes modify the scriptures that he uses given his context and intention. And so this doesn't preclude then Jesus actually citing Isaiah, but Jesus might be kind of modifying it for his purposes in Matthew. The second is that a reasonable explanation can be offered for the lack of verbatim word repetition here. The third is that the syntactical correspondence are accepted by scholars as a valid means for sustaining an illusion. And so where I think here we can say that Hayes's argument might work for Paul, but given the context of the Gospels, we might need to kind of modify it a little bit. So first, Jesus modifies scripture when he cites it or alludes to it. So R.T. France in his book, Jesus in the Old Testament, notes 12 examples where New Testament quotations of the Old Testament differ from both the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Now, I want, I want to focus on these examples. So in Mark 10, 9, Matthew 19, 18 and 19, and Luke 18, 20, Jesus places the command to honor one's parents last or near last in a summative list. However, the Old Testament places this command first in its summative list, Exodus 20, 12 to 16, Deuteronomy 5 to 16. So in all contexts of the synoptics, this is when the rich young ruler approaches Jesus. And, you know, there's this Jesus gives a statement on what the basic tenets of the commands of God's law are. And he lays out these basic commands and the list that Jesus lays out matches Moses's summative list in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But the thing is, is that Jesus kind of changes the order a little bit. Now, it's interesting that he places the command to honor one's parents near last. But this isn't surprising given the fact that Jesus in the New Testament stresses how, for example, he's come to set father against son, son uh, and daughter against mother, or how he's come basically to bring a sword, or how we have to be willing to obey God above even our own parents. And so it kind of makes sense that Jesus would put this command last. Whereas in the Old Testament, I mean, you know, uh, th th that command is placed first both times. The point that I'm making here is that Jesus, even when he alludes to scriptures, will sometimes modify it. And so we wouldn't necessarily expect a verbatim repetition of what's going on in the Old Testament, even if Jesus is using an illusion. In Mark 14, 27 and Matthew 26, 31, we see that Jesus quotes Zechariah 13, 7, but changes the mood from an imperative to indicative. So in Zechariah 13, 7, it says, strike the shepherd. So it's kind of giving a command. Whereas in um, Jesus' usage, he says, I will strike the shepherd when he references Zechariah 13, 7. Now, the reason why Jesus does that is because he's alluding to his own death that is yet to come. And so Jesus changes the mood of the Zechariah 13, 7 passage from imperative to indicative and future tense to convey what is yet to happen. And so notice when Jesus cites Old Testament scriptures, he can modify it given his purposes. And so it's not surprising then that Isaiah might be modified in Jesus's usage in Matthew, given his purposes there. In Luke 17, 31 to 32, Jesus alludes to Genesis 19, 17 and verse 26. But uh, this is in the case of when um, Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt, but replaces look back in Genesis with turn back. He's talking about people who work in the field in the case of, uh, in the case of, you know, Luke. And it's interesting because we know that Jesus is actually talking about Lot's wife because in the next verse, Jesus says, oh, and don't forget Lot's wife. So he's actually saying, I'm using an illusion right now. Guys, pay attention. So um, R.T. France points out, quote, but this is in any case, no more than a verbal reminiscence and the grammar of the sentence in Luke requires the third singular imperative, while the context requires, requires the idea of turning, not simply looking back. And so notice that in Luke's gospel, when Jesus is giving the saying, 
there, there are reasons why Jesus has to kind of modify the original Genesis text to his context in the New Testament. And so this is just pointing out one reasonable explanation that Jesus sometimes modifies scripture. And so we might not expect a verbatim repetition of words. Jesus can modify the scriptures when he alludes to them in the New Testament. And that's what I'm proposing is happening with the case of Isaiah and Matthew. Moreover, there's a reasonable explanation for why there isn't a verbatim repetition of words. So, for example, let's focus on why Jesus uses bind and loose rather than open and shut. To quote Timothy Rucker, who has offered probably the most extensive study on Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16, 19, he quotes, he says this, quote, The fact that the actions of binding and loosing occur in Matthew 16, 19 instead of opening and closing indicates that opening and closing were not natural options to refer to teaching authority at that time. Now, if we know that, for instance, um, Matthew is written maybe in 80 AD, although I know recent scholarship has kind of maybe pushed to a pre-70 date, but that kind of depends. Regardless, we know that in 75 AD in War of the Jews by Josephus, I believe it's in um, Book 1, Chapter 5, Paragraph 2, Josephus mentions how the Pharisees had the power to bind and to loose. So given the fact that we have this usage of referring to the uh, public administrative authority of the Pharisees um, and their ability to basically teach and, and bind the people to their rulings, it would make sense that Jesus would use something that's a bit more contemporaneous, binding and loosing, rather than opening and closing. Um, the other thing I want to point out is in Rabbi Samuel Tobias Locke's commentary on the New Testament, he says the following, quote, quote this is interesting, not only because it involves the house or kingdom of David, but because the language of authority, open shut, is not dissimilar to bind and loosen here in Matthew. There's more that can be said here about, for instance, the meaning of binding and loosing and opening and shutting. I've dealt with um, objections, for instance, that binding and loosing doesn't refer to halakha uh, or, or refers instead to exorcism, for instance, on my Catholic answers appearance. But the point I want to make here is that open, shut, bind, and loose, they're sufficiently similar. Open, shut probably refers to the authority of the Israelite prime minister with the keys on his shoulder, as stated in Isaiah, to open the gates. Um, you can find, for instance, this interpretation in the NIV. I think it's cultural commentary on the Bible. Um, and, for instance, Craig Keener in his commentary on, uh, in, I think, in the New Testament background or in other places will mention the fact that, yeah, open, shut probably refers to open and shutting the gates of the palace, deciding who may see the king and who may not. Whereas bind and loosen in not only Josephus, but rabbinic literature typically refers to the ability of the rabbis and the Jewish authorities to ban or acquit a person based on the application of halakha, that is the normative legal interpretation of the Torah. So all this is to say that both opening and closing and binding and loosing can refer or have a similar idea of deciding who may be in the kingdom or in the community and outside of it. Now, we also see, um, you know, uh, uh, Isaiah saying, "No one, whatever you, whatever you open, none shall shut; whatever you shut, none shall open." But then in, in Matthew, Jesus uses, "Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven; whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." Why does Jesus use "in heaven" here? Well, it's actually connected then to binding and loosing. So Craig S. Keener in his IVP background Bible commentary writes, quote, many Jewish people felt that the Jewish high court acted on the authority of God's tribunal in heaven, in a sense ratifying its decrees. Binding and loosing also referred to detaining or releasing prisoners, hence could function figuratively in a judicial setting. Rabbis also use these terms regularly for legislative authority in interpreting scripture, prohibiting and permitting. Because binding and loosing also were figurative images for punishing and releasing, they could likely be used judicially as well. Okay, but there's this idea in at least later Jewish texts that heaven and earth are in communion, and that when the rabbis or the Jewish authorities on the earth bind, heaven also follows with the ratification. And so it's not surprising then that if Jesus is referring to a kind of rabbinic or, or you know Jewish legislative authority, that then rather than saying no one shall, he uses in heaven, because that's also the appropriate allusion for the time. So for example, in the Babylonian Talmud, Makkot 23b, it says, there are three matters that the earthly court implemented and the heavenly court agreed with them. And then, you know, it, it goes on with, uh, with other things. 
And then even uh, Craig Keener in the Gospel of Matthew, a socio-rhetorical commentary, um, gives other examples of this idea of when the Jewish authorities bind and loose on earth, there's a binding and loosing that occurs in heaven. Um, so this is all to explain then why Jesus doesn't verbatim say no one shall shut or, or no one shall open. He uses in heaven to be this idea of the definitive ruling or final confirmation of the ruling of the earthly authority. So there's a reasonable explanation why no one shall is not repeated in Matthew, given the fact that Jesus has already used binding and loosing. There's also um, an interesting reason why Jesus doesn't use house of David but instead uses kingdom of heaven, right? And the first is that we shouldn't see these two as in total opposition to each other, right? So there's, I noticed this was quite fascinating. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, God says to the prophet Nathan, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your, your throne shall be established forever, right? So that's what God says to uh, David through Nathan. In 1 Chronicles 17, 14, God says, But I will settle him, the foretold son, in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne will be established forever. Notice that God makes the house of David and the kingdom of David his house and his kingdom. Okay, so already there's this idea of the blending of the kingdom of heaven and the house of David. These two things are not separate ideas. In fact, even in later Jewish thought, the Babylonian Talmud Barakat 49a, we see the following. The fact is that, strictly speaking, the blessing who buildest Jerusalem also does not require it, the benediction. But since the kingdom of the house of David is mentioned, it is not seemly that the kingship of heaven also should not be mentioned. So even in later Jewish thought, which shows a consistent tradition, there was this idea that if you mention the house of David, you should also mention the kingdom of heaven or the kingship of God. Okay, so already kingdom of heaven and house of David, these ideas are tied together in the Bible. And we see this, I think, in the New Testament as well, with an allusion back to Isaiah and Matthew. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is just, you know, you know, Jonathan um, Pennington in his book, Heaven and Earth in the Gospel of Matthew, he provides kind of a justification or reason why, you know, for the meaning of what the kingdom of heaven is. I'm not going to read it verbatim because I don't think it's entirely relevant. But I mean, Jesus probably uses this idea of the kingdom of heaven to enhance this idea that it's no longer the emphasis or the thrust of, of Christ coming onto the scene is that God's direct rule is coming through the Messiah. It's no longer God ruling through the house, uh, excuse me, through, through King David and one of his sons in the local Israel. This is a cosmic rule of God that is going to be spread. And so there's a reason then why Jesus would want to say kingdom of heaven rather than house of David. Because that if Jesus maybe uses house of David, it sounds like he's a Messiah for only the Jews and not a cosmic Messiah for even the Gentiles. Okay, so why does Jesus use keys and not key? Well, one is that I think this is a trivial difference. It really doesn't matter. So even on Pints with Aquinas when I appeared the first time, you know, I asked Matt to produce his car keys. And actually, I I have my car keys here, right? And technically, it's only one key to get into the car. But we refer to it in the plural anyway. And so I propose maybe this is what's going on here, right? But I later found, looking back through the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation actually does something similar. It actually switches between the key singular and the key plural. So in Revelation 118, obviously Jesus, who has the keys, it says here, and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades, right? And a lot of people will say this is an allusion back to, you know, Matthew 16, um, uh, 18, where the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. And so, you know, Jesus has the keys, right? But then you see in Revelation 3, 7, when the allusion to Isaiah 22 is made, it says, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David. Notice that the same keys, if you will, are referred to in the singular and the plural. So in the mind of at least, let's say, John in the book of Revelation, key versus keys doesn't make a huge difference for him. Likewise, G.K. Beale in his book, The Handbook of the New Testament Use of the Old, um, he says the difference in singular key and plural keys is likely not significant. But I mean, one could maybe argue that um, the reason why keys are used in the plural is because Jesus is the son of David and the son of God. And so they correspond 
to these two kingdoms in the one Messiah. And I mean, I like that interpretation, um, but I just don't think that key versus keys is relevant. But when I look through um, R.T. Francis commentary, uh, New International Critical Commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, um, France actually offers an interesting footnote, and he cites uh, Ulrich Luz. And Ulrich Luz proposes there's a reason why the keys are plural. So here's what he says, quote, Now Peter's function as a rock is stated. The issue is no longer the church's building, but the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whoever has the keys is either the gatekeeper or what is more probable with several keys, the manager who has authority over his Lord's rooms and buildings. And so perhaps the reason why, you know, uh, Peter doesn't just have one key, but multiple keys given to him by Christ is to convey his expansive authority. It's not over just the gates of, let's say, entering the kingdom of heaven, but it's over all the rooms of the kingdom of heaven, multiple keys that would exist perhaps on a chain. And I remember um, somebody criticized Daniel Vecchio for having a similar interpretation. But I think that uh, Daniel is in right standing with even some of the scholars on this issue, that there are, that the keys might refer to perhaps something like a, a, a chain of keys that Peter has received. But that's one po possibility for why keys is used in the New Testament and not simply key in the Old Testament. The third thing I want to mention is that the syntactical correspondences between both passages have been accepted by scholars as enough to establish the illusion. So, for example, Bruce Chilton, in his essay, Shebna Eliakim and the Promise to Peter, he writes the following, quote, Our finding in respect of the attitude conveyed in the Targumic paraphrase of Isaiah 22 would be strengthened if a similarly voiced promise to Eliakim could be found elsewhere, but in the relevant period. As it happens, a generally recognized reference to Isaiah 22, 22 is to be found in Matthew 16, 19. Notice that even in 1997, it was generally recognized. This is not a new thing that Catholics have invented. Where Peter is promised that whatever he binds on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever he looses on earth will be loosed in heaven. Despite the distinction of the diction, or the word choice, from the Mesoretic text in the Torgum, the syntactical similarity has been taken to be enough to warrant the judgment that they are textual illusions. Moreover, Benedict Green, in his commentary on Matthew, he notes, quote, here a reference to Isaiah 22, 22, speaking of Matthew 16, 19, despite the apparent absence of the words from the LXX or the Septuagint is inescapable. Okay, so the scholars are in agreement that there is a textual illusion and they base it upon the syntactical correspondences, even if there aren't verbatim repetition of words that isn't necessary to establish the illusion. Okay, so I think we clearly have the standard of repetition met for the illusion between Matthew and Isaiah. How about the precursor text? Now, one thing that I want to point out is that, um, let me see if I have it on the slide here. Um, okay, well, one thing that we have to point out is that the use of Isaiah in Jewish, the, the use, Isaiah 22, 22 was not popularly used in Jewish thought. Rucker shows that later, you know, post-apostolic times, you see this appear more in Jewish commentaries. But the whole episode with Shebna and Eliakim is not used much or referenced much um, in, in Jewish thought. So it seems as if the phrase was not as popular as, let's say, obviously, the it's not as popular as the Shema. Um, it's not as popular as, you know, something like the Our Father, right? But we should note that the New Testament, especially Matthew, has um, you know new interpretations of seemingly obscure passages, right? So, for example, Jeremiah thirty-one fifteen and Hosea eleven one is used by Matthew to talk about, I believe, the slaughter of the innocents. And the thing is, nobody had used this before to refer to a messianic kind of connotation. But Matthew goes back into the scriptures when he when he you know receives his tradition on what happened uh, with King Herod slaughtering the innocents and finds these scriptural passages and views them messianically, right? And so just because we don't have let's say these other kind of popular Jewish usages for the passage, that doesn't mean that Matthew was bound to those customs. Matthew is as we see in his own usage of the Old Testament, goes back and sees 
these connections and will bring them into the forefront. And even Jesus, you know, because I believe this, this saying is historical, it wasn't invented by Matthew as a redactor, but Jesus actually historically said it. Multiple arguments for why that's the case. You can find this in um, Craig Keener's, I think, 1991 commentary on a Tyndale commentary on Matthew, and even it's reiterated or actually it originally is found in W.D. Davies and Dale Allison's International Critical Commentary, Matthew. All of this is to say that um, that was an aside about the historicity of the passage, that Jesus, I think, definitely said these words. Um, but the point is that Matthew can use passages that weren't properly used in Jewish thought for with messianic connotations, and he can go back and use them with messianic connotations in his gospel. And so simply because Isaiah 22, 22 was not popularly used in Jewish thought for messianic overtones or, you know, for, for the covenant to come, that doesn't mean that Matthew was bound by that custom. The final thing is rhetoric, right? And so I think there, there's definitely the same rhetorical stress between Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16. And there are multiple ways to establish this, and I'll get the, into this in the next few slides. But the basic idea is that in, in Isaiah 22, Eliakim's office is being revealed, and it's being given to him in a significant, congratu almost congratulatory way um, and prophetic way. And Jesus in the New Testament, when he gives allegedly this office to Peter, it's also done with the same rhetorical stress of revealing this identity of Peter, of this kind of climax, right, of this great vestiture of authority. And so I think there are definitely the same rhetorical stresses in both passages. So let me go then to recurrence. So recurrence is this idea that there are references in the immediate context or elsewhere by the same author to the same Old Testament context from which the purported allusion derives. So, for example, if uh, Matthew uses Isaiah 22, 22, um, we would maybe expect, or at least we would, to strengthen the case, we would want there to be other times where he uses other parts of Isaiah. That increases the probability of an allusion. So I think that one place where we can see other parts of Isaiah being used by Matthew is, for example, in the reference to the son of the man being given, uh, excuse me, the father of the man being given the keys. So in Isaiah 22, 20, you know, it says, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. Well, in Matthew 16, 17, it says Simon bar Jonah, Aramaic for son of. So Simon, son of Jonah. Okay, so we see both times fathers are being mentioned. That seems to be an allusion to Isaiah 22, 20 in Matthew 16, 17. The other thing that I pointed out is that in Isaiah 22, 23, we see this idea of a firm peg or a throne of glory to describe Eliakim's ministry. And then in Matthew 16, 18, we see Peter being identified as the rock of the church. And so in both contexts, you have objects being used to liken the kind of authority that is being given to this person, the ministry or the endowment. And so I would say here that, yeah, other parts of the Isaiah passage are being used by Matthew in, in a subtle way. And so this increases the probability of the, the standard of recurrence being fulfilled. The other thing I want to say, too, is that when we that I think the case is even stronger also when we look at the thematic coherence between both Isaiah and Matthew. Similar themes appear in both passages, and scholars have also noted this point and have argued that this is another way of establishing that there is an illusion going on in Matthew back to Isaiah. So let me first explain what I mean by thematic coherence. So thematic coherence is this idea that, quote, the alleged Old Testament illusion is suitable and satisfying in that its meaning in the Old Testament not only thematically fits into the New Testament writer's argument, but also illuminates it. So, for example, Rucker in page 162 of his um, more Seebeck book, he makes an argument that um, Isaiah 22 appears in Matthew 16 with this idea that as, you know, there's a transition from Shebna to Eliakim, Jesus is arguing that there's a transition from the Pharisees and the Sadducees to Peter. So here's what he says, quote, Rather, the actions of binding and loosing are fitting substitutes in context. A transfer of teaching authority for the kingdom of the heavens from the Pharisees and Sadducees, 16, 5 to 12, to Peter, 16, 16 and 19. 
Additionally, the shift of leadership from one authority to another understandably evokes the context of Isaiah 22, 22 for some scholars. Thematic coherence. Or even in Walter Brueggemann's commentary on Isaiah 1 to 39, he uses this example of Peter conveying both Shebna and Eliakim in a way through thematic correspondence. He says, quote, we may extrapolate as the church always has done to recognize that immediately after this high investiture of Peter, the very next paragraph in Matthew condemns him as a would-be Shebna who is unfaithful. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Thus, Shebna and Eliakim model the shame and glory that is always being enacted toward the second in command in service to the king. So there's a theme of shame and glory going on. Now, I know what somebody's going to say at this point. Someone's going to say, oh, well, then, Swan, there's a, a new Shebna typology going on here, right? And the reason why that's not the case is because when we go back to the syntactical correspondences, it's primarily between Peter and Eliakim. The theme, however, of Shebna's disloyalty can appear again, I think, elsewhere to enhance the illusion back to Isaiah. But I don't think that, uh, that Peter is a new Shebna, especially given the fact that Peter actually successfully completes his ministry for Christ. And so to say that Peter's the new Shebna is unfitting um, in that way. Or at least maybe you could say that Peter is the antithesis of Shebna. But regardless, I don't think there's a new Shebna typology going on here. Only the themes of shame and glory are being repeated. And moreover, the syntactical correspondence nails Peter and Eliakim together. Anyway, um, and then John T. Willis, in his essay um, on Isaiah 22, 15 and its function in the New Testament, um, John T. Willis has done extensive studies on Micah and Isaiah. He points out that there's also this idea of Peter's, or excuse me, Eliakim's rise and fall that is repeated in, in Matthew. So he says this, quote, The sequence of Peter's God-revealed confession of Jesus, followed by Peter's Satan-motivated objection to Jesus' proclamation that he must suffer and die, corresponds strikingly to the sequence of God's elevation of Eliakim to Shebna's office, followed by a prophetic announcement that he and all his household will fall. The language of Jesus' promise to give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven calls to mind God's promise to Eliakim um, to Isaiah 22, 22. That might be in. That might be the proper um, word there. And the sequence of Peter's confession of and opposition to Jesus calls to mind the sequence of Eliakim's rise and fall. So notice other scholars who are defending the textual illusion between both passages are noting the thematic coherence between both of them. Now, if you recall, uh, when satisfying the recurrence criterion, I not only cited Isaiah 22, 20 and, um, you know, and another part of Isaiah, but I also mentioned that I wanted to put thematic coherence there as well to establish that there are recurrences going on. Now, someone might say, Swan, that's an illegitimate kind of, you know, hodgepodging the two standards together so that you can build up your case, right? When in reality, you're admitting that the case for recurrence is weak. My response is that actually scholars know that Hayes's criteria can overlap. And so sometimes you could have something that is in thematic coherence that could be a piece of evidence for recurrence as well. So, for example, G.K. Beale, he points out using other standards that overlap, quote, Indeed, thematic coherence and satisfa satisfaction, which we're going to get to later, are so overlapping that they could be combined into one criterion. So, for example, if I present evidence for one criterion, it could overlap with another criterion, and both can be used, uh, the same evidence can be used to verify both criterions or criteria. They both focus on how the theme from the Old Testament context functions in the New Testament theme, in the New Testament context, and how much that Old Testament theme, so notice you could even throw in thematic coherence with what Beale is saying, illuminates the New Testament author's argument in the context. Likewise, the first, availability, and fifth criteria, historical plausibility, have some overlap. Thus, one could reduce Hayes' seven criteria to five. The point is that um, Hayes' criteria can overlap. The same evidence that you might use for one criteria could also, a criterion could satisfy another criterion. All right, so the fifth um, one for establishing a textual illusion is historical plausibility. So here's what Hayes writes, quote, could Paul in fact have intended the alleged meaning effect of any proposed illusion and could his first century readers have understood it? 
Um, and then Hayes also says in his 1989 work, um, let's see here, the value of the test is to make us wary of readings that turn Paul into, say, a Lutheran or a deconstructionist. One implication of this criterion is to give serious preference to interpretive proposals that allow Paul to remain a Jew. So basically what Hayes is saying here is that, okay, if we're proposing a textual illusion, the textual illusion should not knack of anachronism. It, you know, the illusion shouldn't be grounded or somehow justified on, let's say, oh, well, Paul is, you know, kind of arguing in, in a way that would not actually jive with the, the Judaism of his time, right? And so uh, I, I can't think of an example off the, off the top of my head, but there's this idea that, okay, let's respect the historical context. And if you're saying there is an illusion, does that illusion make sense in the Jewish context of the New Testament? Now, obviously, Hayes is referring here to Paul, but you could re let's replace Paul with Matthew. And I think you get the same idea of what I'm saying. So is there historical plausibility for an illusion Back to Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16. Well, the first thing to point out is that the text of Isaiah was widely considered scripture during the time of Jesus. And it's also constantly used by the New Testament writers to validate the messianic claims of Jesus. So there's a strong historical plausibility that we would have an allusion back to Isaiah when Jesus' status as the Messiah and the son of, uh, the, son of the living God would be revealed. Um, moreover, I mean, given the fact that the keys of the house of David belong to the house of David, the allusion uh, back to Isaiah 22 makes Jesus not only stand in the person of God, because, you know, God is the one who gives the keys of the house of David to Eliakim, but it also makes Jesus stand in the place of the Davidic king because the keys belong to the house of David. And so there is a valid messianic chain to why Isaiah 22 would be used in the Matthew 16 context. It does place Jesus in the position of being the son of David over the house of David, such that he can give the keys um, that are mentioned in Isaiah. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, the keys uh, of, or, excuse me, Isaiah 22 was not widely discussed by Jews during this time. Um, you can see that quotation from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. But nonetheless, it is used messianically in Revelation 3.7. And so I think this also needs to count as something relevant. At least another apostle, John, recognized that Isaiah 22 could be used messianically. And G.K. Buell argues this point, and Gerhard von Rad in his two-volume comment, uh, two-volume work, Old Testament theology or something like that, also makes a similar argument for a messianic typological usage. So the point is that among the apostles um, and, and, and who were Jews during this time, using Isaiah 22 messianically was not unheard of. And so even if other Jewish literature does not use Isaiah 22 um, you know, messianically, the apostle Paul uh, John used it that way. And so at least that increases the probability that this was not absent from even the mind of Matthew. Um, so I think there is definite historical plausibility between an Isaiah Matthew illusion. Um, let's see here. And then also, you know, I explained elsewhere, you know, what, where I think that this illusion works for establishing the Davidic messianic claims of Christ. Um, and I want to point out that John T. Willis likewise makes a similar argument. He says, quote, fifth, Matthew 16, 13 to 23 assumes the reader knows the context of Isaiah 22, 15 to 25. And in Matthew 16, 19, Jesus borrows the language of Isaiah 22, 22. According to Matthew 16, 16, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That is that Jesus is king. The expression son of God is one of the common Old Testament titles for a king. And the context of Matthew 16, 16 shows Peter had the nuance in mind in his confession. Not the idea that Jesus is divine as in other New Testament contexts. Jesus commends Peter for the words he used, but not for his understanding of those words. So what John Willis is saying here is that when Peter confesses that Jesus Christ is the, you know, is the Messiah, the son of the living God, you know, the son of God, the son of the living God, that's a title that is used often for, you know, the kings of, of the Old Testament. Um, now, I actually think that what's going on here is that despite the fact that Peter might have only understood those words in, let's say, um, a Davidic messianic triumphant context, um, I think that God intended for that, for when he revealed that to Peter to say it, 
to have that also double meaning of also the deity and the sonship of God, of the son of God, right? So, I, I mean, this is not denying, this is not saying that Peter denies the sonship of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, as the son of God. But it is saying that when Peter says these words that are given to him by God, he actually doesn't understand fully what he's saying. And he only interprets the son of the living God as referring to an Old Testament title for a king. But he also misses the fact that this is also referring to the deity of Christ as the divine son of God. Right. And so, you know, I include the note here that Peter understood everything Jesus was saying in Davidic messianic terms. That's good. But there's another meaning that Jesus intends, which is, you know, that, that, that you know, well, well, Peter's condemned for his refusal to reconcile this truth with the cross, that Jesus is the divine son of God who is going to die for the sins of the world as the perfect sacrifice, the perfect uh, incarnational link between God and man. But regardless, scholars have made the argument that, yes, there's Isaiah 22 is being invoked here, and you have a clear reason why it would be invoked for the messianic claims of Christ. You know, Jesus was just called the son of the living God, you know, and, and, and this is a title for Old Testament kings. It would make sense then that Jesus would, you know, I don't want to say play along with this, but he would also then go on to use a passage that describes the royal house of David. Um, okay, so then this is the sixth standard, which is the history of interpretation. And this is um, one that I know that a lot of um, kind of Orthodox and even Protestants have used against identifying a textual illusion. They say that, oh, there's not enough citations or support, right, for this illusion. So let me just explain the standard and defend why I think there is a good history of interpretation with Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16, 19. Quote, it is important to survey the history of the interpretation of the New Testament passage in order to see if others uh, if others have observed the illusion, that's a typo. Yet this is one of the least reliable criteria in recognizing illusions. Though a study of past interpretation may reveal the possible illusions proposed by others, it can also reveal to a narrow uh, lead to a narrowing of the possibilities, since commentators can tend uh, to follow earlier commentators, and since commentary tradition always has the possibility of distorting or misinterpreting and losing the fresh and creative approach of the New Testament writers' intertextual collocations. So notice that even though this can be an important kind of guide to help identify an illusion, it is recognized as not being one of the most reliable. And so this idea that some people have raised of solus patribus, that it must be totally found in the fathers or else it's an invalid illusion, that's kind of uh, taking that standard a bit too far. I think it's I think having the fathers is a good uh, indication and verification that, OK, you know, it's not just, you know, someone anachronistically imagining this. But at the same time, though, you know, to, to take that as the one standard, that's everything that also is a bit of a stretch. Likewise, Richard Hayes in his 1989 commentary says the following, quote, the readings of our predecessors can both check and stimulate our perception of scriptural echoes in Paul. While this test is po a possible restraint against arbitrariness, it is also one of the least reliable guides for interpretation because Gentile Christian readers at a very early date lost Paul's sense of urgency about relating the gospel to God's dealings with Israel and slightly later began readings Paul, reading Paul's letters within the interpretive matrix of the New Testament canon. So it's possible that over the course of time, as we get disconnected from the original context, you know, commentators might be giving their own proposal on what they think is a plausible interpretation. Now, I, I want to stress that some people say, well, Swan, then why don't you reject then, you know, when the fathers have a tradition? The reason why is because there's a difference between when a father is claiming they have a tradition from the apostles and when a father is engaging in, exegetical, in an exegetical tradition that may or may not have come from the apostles, right? And so I think there's a difference between the two in that I think the latter can be mistaken or it, it has to be judged by its merits, whereas the former, I think, stands on its own. If it's a tradition from the apostles, then that, as you know, Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, that counts as a valid like guide for the church. But regardless, I'm kind of getting you know out of topic here. But the point is that, yeah, history of interpretation can help point out certain things, but it's not the end-all be-all. Now, I was delighted to learn 
from Daniel Vecchio and actually from uh, Father Christian Caps and uh, William Albrecht that we do have an early uh, patristic uh, reference to Isaiah 22, 22 from Matthew 16, 19 in a church father. So let me quote uh, Joanna Manley, who writes in Isaiah Through the Ages, um, you know, published by St. Vladimir Seminary Press, quote, the principal patristic commentary to, to commentators on the book of Isaiah were Theodoret of Cyrus, St. John Chrysostom, St. Cyril of Alexandria, and Eusebius of Caesarea. Now, we have in Theodoret of Cyrus an illusion, a recognition of the illusion back to Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16. Now, I know I've seen people say when Daniel presented this on my YouTube channel, oh, but Theodore was a controversial church father. You know, he's not a saint. He might be blessed, um, you know, but like, you know, and it's like, no, you're changing the goalpost, right? You're changing the goalpost to that point. What we want to see is in the history of the interpretation of Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16, 19 was an illusion recognized. And this is the earliest one that we have on record, and it goes to the fifth century. So the translation that I have here is from Father Caps, and it's from an unpublished book manuscript that he's working with uh, William Albrecht, titled A Pope Gone Wild. And this is the manuscript that he gave me um, from the March 15th edition of the trans uh, manuscript. I, I don't, I, maybe he's updated it. But here's what Father Caps notes. Um, he notes, quote, uh, this is quoting Theodoret now. Um, First, he's citing the Greek, uh, ver so Theodora uses a certain version of Isaiah and then gives the commentary. So, and I will give the glory of David to him and he shall rule and there will not be someone contradicting. And I will give him the key of David's house upon the shoulder of him and he shall open and no one shall shut and he shall shut and there will not be someone opening. Now, I know what someone's going to say here. Oh, but Swan, you said that this isn't the most reliable manuscript according to the scholars. While that's true among the scholars, that doesn't mean that you see, uh, excuse me, that Theodora didn't have access to at least a version of the LXX. That's what matters here, right? If he, you know, what version of the LXX did he have? And then, okay, so anyway, going on. On this matter, too, our own realities are prototypified. It's a typology. He's using the word <laughs> prototype. For he, Jesus says, Whatever you should bind upon the earth shall be bound in the heavens, and whatever you should loose on the earth shall be loosed in the heavens. Now, this is going to be a battleground passage because, um, you know, Joanna Manley, when she interpret, when she translates this passage, she thinks that it's an allusion back to Matthew 18, 18 and not 16, 19. And even when I had Daniel Vecchio on my show, he thought that since the words for you are plural, um, that this is a reference to 1818. But what Father Caps found was that the use of heavens is plural, and that is only found in 1619. So what's going on here? Well, so Father Caps makes the argument that it is, you know, it's only referencing 1619. Um, now, he might change his mind and also say it references 1818, but I'm saying that what he told me was that it's 1619. What I, what I proposed to Daniel Vecchio, and I was able to convince Daniel of this point, was that it's possible that Theodore mashed the two verses together so that he uses the U plural of uh, 1818, but uses the heavens plural of 1619. And so he's Theodore is <laughs> making the illusion back to both uh, back, back to both uh, from 1619, 1818 to Isaiah 22. Okay, so that means that definitely 1619 is being considered a typological allusion to Isaiah 22, 22. I should also mention that uh, Joanna Manley, um, in her in her translation of this passage, she considers um, the I, version of Isaiah that she thinks that Theodore used was only the one with the glory of David, not the key of David. But I but I think that what makes more sense is that it would be the key of David as well, because with the glory alone, you won't really get, and yeah, without, without, you know, um, the key of David and the open and shut, I don't think it's possible to really see the illusion back to Isaiah. And so I think that Theodoret 
has the Greek variant that Father Caps is proposing and not the one that Joanna Manley proposes in her um, translation. So anyway, let's see here. And I will get, okay, so, and I shall establish him as a ruler in a faithful locale. So Theodore moves from 22 to 23. Uh, and he shall be unto the, he shall be unto the throne of glory by the house of his father. So then Theodore says, according to this quote too, he gives to him, St. Peter, the priestly and governing jurisdiction. Wherefore, too, he was mindful of David, for David is not a priest, but a king, but all the same he, Jesus, orders the priesthood. So this is a definite allusion back to Isaiah 22, recognized by Theodoret and Matthew. Now, there might be a few places where I disagree with Theodoret. Like, for instance, I think that David was simultaneously a priest and a king of sorts. Um, but the, the, the fact is, is that even when you look at, for instance, the, the, the Patrologiae Cursus Completus Sirius Graeca uh, Thomas 11 uh, LXXI, which is, I believe, 81, um, on page 355, on the footnote of that translation of Theodoret's commentary on Isaiah, the commentator or maybe it's Theodore, I don't know who exactly it is, but the footnote under this passage says that Theodore is citing Matthew 16, 19. So this is a, definitely an early citation of uh, allusion of Isaiah back to Matthew. Also, the reason why I'm looking this way is because I have a large screen that I'm using to kind of help me see because it's a bit hard here. Um, and I should also mention... Um, that, you know, throughout history, you know, so if we had to make a chart of the amount of illusions, of the, the times that these illusions were made, you know, from Isaiah to Matthew uh, in this in 22 to 16, you know, admittedly in the early patristic period, maybe only Theodore, um, maybe Ephraim, but I, I'm, I'm more convinced of the Theodore one, you know, you would have the chart kind of go low. And then during about the time of um, St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, you know, post-schism, it shoots up. And then during the time of the Reformation, it's go through the roof, right? So Isaiah 22, Matthew 16, 19 definitely has a history of interpretation. Now, and notice that the standard for history of interpretation is just the history of interpretation. At any point, even today among scholars, it's a consensus that there's an illusion here. So it doesn't really matter like someone might say, oh, history of interpretation, you can only count the patristics in the first thousand years in pre-schism. It's like, no, nope, that's not what the standard says. If there's a history of interpretation, regardless of when exactly it appears in the history of the church, so be it. Like It counts as history of interpretation. But I mean, this is icing on the cake. We have one of the principal patristic commentators on Isaiah making the illusion. And if you want to see more of um, kind of these illusions, Daniel has posted, uh, I had at my, uh, you know Daniel on my channel, and um, he's addressed in the comments section some objections to his research. Okay, so let's get to satisfaction then. So satisfaction is this, is this idea, quote, with or without confirmation from the preceding six criteria, so obviously this stands alone, does the proposed illusion and its interpretive usage make sense in the immediate context? Does it illuminate the surrounding context? Does it enhance the rhetorical punch of the point being made by the New Testament writer? Does the use of the illusion result in a satisfying account of how the author intended the illusion and how this use of the illusion would have made its effect upon the reader? So ultimately, the idea is that does this illusion, if it is valid, um, fit within Matthew's theology? Does Matthew have a reason uh, to make such an illusion? And I mean, I mean, what we find is that in, in both contexts, right, of Matthew and Isaiah, you know, identities are being revealed. So there's a rhetorical punch that is consonant in both Matthew 16 and Isaiah 22. And actually, somebody might say, oh, but like in the context of Matthew 16, it's Jesus's identity being revealed, not Peter. And so this seems to make more sense with a, a Jesus Eliakim typology. What I'm going to show later on is that, no, also Peter's identity is being revealed in Matthew 16. And so that's how you get the correspondence between the reveal of the identity and office of Eliakim and the reveal and the identity of the office of Peter, right? So that's how you can get the same rhetorical punch. And as I mentioned before, you know, an allusion to Isaiah uh, back in Matthew would enhance the deity of Christ and his royal status as king since he's bestowing the keys of the house of David. Um, 
And then, you know, I, I give other reasons, but clearly I think the standard of satisfaction is met here. All right, so let's return then to the original standards that we were proposed for identifying an illusion between uh, Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16, 19. Clearly we saw in the sources availability being there for Jesus when he's saying this phrase in Aramaic. I, I mean, I think maybe given our the manuscripts that we have, maybe Jesus had the Hebrew text, but when he's speaking in Aramaic, a dialect of Hebrew, you know, he has, um, you know, he's speaking with the, the Hebrew text in his background, in his mind. Maybe that's what he was raised with, right? Or maybe there was a Targum that Jesus had access to, although Targums became more popular during um, like Talmudic times or at least post first century. Um, but I mean, it's possible that you had Targums even during the first century. Although I'm saying that I think what's most likely is that Jesus had the Hebrew text as his referent. There's um, volume uh, in terms of repetition. Um, maybe not so much in the um, kind of prominence, although I think a case could be made for the prominence of the Isaiah 22 text, given how even um, John uses it messianically in Revelation 3.7. And then finally, um, I think there was this idea of, oh, I'm trying to remember what it was like, rhetorical stress, right? And I think there's the same rhetorical stress. So I think the criterion of volume is clearly met, especially since scholars accept the syntactical correspondence as being enough to establish the illusion. Um, you have the standard of recurrence clearly being met, I believe, as um, you know, as we reviewed, for instance, the ways in which other parts of Isaiah seem to be referenced or alluded to in Matthew 16, and even the thematic coherence that's there. I, I think there's a clear historical plausibility. There's also the history of interpretation of seeing an illusion between these two verses and their satisfaction within Matthew's theology. Okay, so clearly here, I think there is a textual illusion. The other thing that I want to mention, too, is that if anyone wants to argue that there was not a textual illusion between Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16, they have to do two things. The first thing that they have to do is that they have to first propose a standard for how they identify textual illusions upon which to adjudicate. The second thing is that they have to show somehow that either um, the text that I'm proposing does not, the illusion that I'm proposing does not meet Richard Hayes standards, or there are problems with Richard Hayes standard. But the fact is that Richard Hayes standard is, uh, standards are mainstream among scholars. Okay, so what I'm using here to verify this illusion is not a Roman Catholic gimmick. Um, it's not something that I invented. It's something that is widely recognized among scholars. I'm using a standard methodology here. Okay. You know, and I'd even add like an eighth criterion because since, um, uh, since uh, you know, uh, Richard Hayes' standard was used for Paul, um, there's also this idea that, well, the Gospels do have a consonant voice on the character of Jesus to some extent, right? Like Jesus seems to have this constant theme of like the kingdom of God. He seems to often use Isaiah. And I think this is relevant because this increases the probability of an illusion on Jesus's part. So for instance, in Luke 4, 16 to 21, Jesus, when he reveals in the synagogue that he's the Messiah, references Isaiah 58, 6 and 61, 1 to 2. And so you can kind of consider this a cherry on top, right? I think that given the historical character of the person of Jesus, it's very likely that he would have used Isaiah when his messianic identity was revealed and Isaiah 22 fits the pattern beautifully. So, you know, to conclude at least this first phase of the argument, which has lasted us nearly half uh, an hour and a half, um, but it must be done because I'm very serious about establishing an illusion. Um, we see, for example, what I've quoted before with Patrick Gray, where he says that many scholars discern an illusion to the ancient Israelite practice of the king granting authority to a prime minister who as holder of the key of the house of David is deputized to make binding decisions on his behalf. Likewise, Craig L. Blomberg says the keys to the kingdom 1619 almost certainly is based on the identical metaphor in Isaiah 22, 22, or even RT France, when he says in his book, Matthew evangelist and teacher, Isaiah 22 generally is regarded as the old Testament background to the metaphor of the keys here. Um, and so, you know, I remember Gavin Ortland kind of, you know, mentioned these before and he said, oh yeah, you know, yeah, there's a textual illusion here. And I want to say like, you know, thanks to Gavin, I'm able to order this properly. Right. So yes, there is a textual illusion 
between Isaiah and Matthew. I'm no longer, you know, and I, 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 I sloppily said that they agreed on a typology, right? No, they agree on a textual illusion. And so now I'm able to put these passages in their proper argumentative context. And so on to thank Gavin. But obviously some might say, okay, Swan, do you have any new sources? Like you cited these last time when you were on capturing Christianity and responding. Well, yes, I do actually. So G.K. Beale in his handbook on the Old Testament, New Testament use of the old, he cites several published sources. And so in this section of the book, G.K. Beale is saying, these are the go-to sources that you want to use for identifying illusions in scholarship, right? And so... Um, he says, quote, several published sources indicate where quotations and allusions occur in the New Testament. The first source to turn to is the 27th edition of the Nestle Alan Novum Testamentum Graeci. The editors have placed in the outer margins of each page an Old Testament reference where they think a quotation or allusion occurs in the corresponding part of the body uh, of this Greek New Testament text. Interpreters still must decide whether the references to illusions meet the criteria for being valid. Okay, so obviously, just because the Novum Testamentum Greitke says it, that doesn't mean that it's definitive, infallible, ex cathedra, right? That there is an illusion. But I looked at the 28th edition of the Novum Testamentum Greitke, which came out about the same time that G.K. Beale's book came out. And so, you know, Beale only had the 27th edition, the 28th edition, you know, he wouldn't have access to it just yet. And what we find in the Greek translation done by the Institute for New Testament Textual Research is the following. If you look on the left side of the margin for the, on page, uh, for, on page 52 for the uh, Greek text of Matthew 16, 19, you see multiple passages that are being referenced for a possible illusion. Notice Isaiah 22, 22 is right there. So even in the 20, the latest edition of the Nestle Aland, Novum Testamentum Graeci, the scholars who assembled and you know did that translation, they recognized an allusion to Isaiah 22, 22. We are in, this is the scholarly gold standard. <laughs> and we have it here for the textual allusion back to Isaiah. Okay, so I'm getting too excited. Um, so now premise two, right? The best explanation for the textual illusion, and, and notice that I'm focusing on the key premises, right? So some of the premises are kind of, you know, part of the argument, but they're not the key ones. I'm focusing on the key premises. So, um, you know, you're going to see that later on because I kind of skip around on which premises I defend. The best explanation for the textual illusion is either A, a Jesus Eliakim typology, B, the similar function of the keys, or C, a Peter Eliakim typology. So the reason why I think it's this, it's these three is because, look, the, the main thrust of what's going on in Isaiah 20, uh, excuse me, of Matthew 16, 19 is, and sorry, I'm looking at my phone to make, it's because I'm trying to check the stream to make sure everything's flowing properly. Um, the reason why I think it's, it's either Jesus, the keys, or Peter is because those are the main characters or objects in Matthew 16, 19. It's Jesus, the keys, or Peter, right? Um, so, I mean, you could probably add other things. Like maybe you want to make an argument that um, there's an illusion going on with, uh, you know, the illusion that's going on here is due to maybe, I don't know, kingdom of heavens, right? Or, you know, something like that. Um, so maybe this might not be exhaustive, but these are the three main proposals. And I think that what I'm going to show in the course of this argument here is that regardless, the Peter Eliakim typology is the definitive best can, uh, reason for why this textual illusion is happening. So I'm focusing on just kind of these three main candidates that could be proposed. Okay, so let's focus on the Jesus Eliakim typology, right? So G.K. Beale argues for a typological relationship between Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19 in his handbook in 2012. And Gerhard von Rad argues the same thing in his two-volume uh, commentary on the Old Testament theology. So, I mean, obviously, then it's already established that Eliakim is a type for Jesus in the book of Revelation. So someone might say, ah, but Swan, since it's already established, and even they might say more clearly in Revelation 3-7 that Eliakim is a type for Jesus, then the, then the Jesus Eliakim typology is what's going on in Matthew. Right. And so I'm anticipating that this objection might arise. OK, there's one candidate. The second candidate is that, you know, someone might say, well, Swan, I mean, the scholars that you're citing, they're saying that they agree that the keys of Isaiah 22, 22 are the background metaphor for Matthew 16, 19. 
And so therefore, what is being alluded to or played on is not Peter and Eliakim, it's the keys, right? So that's a possible second candidate, okay? So let me tell you, oh, okay, then, okay, th then there's the one I'm proposing, which is the Peter Eliakim typology. Okay, so before I told you that I was working on research uh, on the nature and identification of biblical typology, unfortunately, I wasn't able to finish the paper in time before I leave to the Dominican order. Nonetheless, I'm going to use the research that I had done there and use it here to justify why I think the relationship between Peter and Eliakim is typological, but not only typological, but actually a valid biblical typology. So here, I remember before people were complaining when I debated Gavin Ortland, oh, you know, Swan was kind of just saying it's a typology, but he didn't justify it. I'm fulfilling that need now by giving you the standards that I research and my calming of the literature and my study of the scriptures. Okay, so we're going to first look at the nature of typology and then look into how we identify it, right? So let's make sure that we get the nature of typology right so that I can validly say, okay, is there a typology here between Peter and Eliakim? So Michael Fishbane's um, comment, uh, uh, biblical interpretation in ancient Israel is largely considered the, the kind of text for explaining typology in the Bible. Um, uh, this is especially mentioned in, um, I think it's Richard Onsworth's book, Joshua Typology in the New Testament. This is considered one of the standard staple treatments of typology. I mean, even in, you're going to see below in Robinson's, um, I think it's 2018 doctoral dissertation on Markin typology, Fishbane is still referred to as the go-to scholar on typology. So here's what Fishbane says. Uh, quote, inner biblical typologies constitute a literary historical phenomenon which isolates perceived correlations between specific events, persons, or places early in time with their later correspondence. They will never be precisely identical with their prototype, but inevitably stand in a hermeneutical relationship with them. Okay, so to break that down a little bit, typology is a historical phenomenon, right? So it's not a form, many scholars will, you know, chastise people who say typology is a form of exegesis. What the biblical author is saying is, I have observed or seen God repeat history in a way, analogically, not, you know, not univocally, you know, so, so it's never going to be a one-for-one -one correspondence. Um, but the, the, the biblical author is saying, I've seen God basically repeat history analogically. And um, they write it down in a way that shows the illusion between what they're seeing now and what they see in the earlier scriptures, in the earlier events of the Bible, right? And so it has a literary phenomenon as well to it. It's a literary historical phenomenon. Um, and yes, obviously they stand in, her, in a hermeneutical relationship with them. I should also mention that there are two kinds of typology. There's vertical typology and horizontal typology. Vertical typology, you know, occurs in the book of Romans when Paul talks about how, you know, the earthly things reflect the heavenly realm, right? So vertical typology is pointing out a correspondence between something in the supernatural realm and in the earthly realm, whereas horizontal, yeah, vertical, horizontal typology points to a correspondence within history, within God's timeline and view of the world. Okay, so then in Jonathan Robinson's um, Oh, it's 2020, not 2018. I apologize. A doctoral dissertation. You know, he points out that we have to be a little bit careful here that we don't begin with a too narrow definition of typology, right? So Fishbane, you know, he he's capturing the grasp of it, right? But I don't want to go out, you know, guns blazing with what my standards are for typology because I don't. I want to point out that typology is a very delicate thing. It's very nuanced, right? So Robinson says the following quote. Young's definition, he's citing a scholar, is who's citing Fishbane, is chosen here to avoid anachronistic categorical precision. For example, in commentaries on Galatians and 1 Corinthians, debates over whether Paul employs allegory, typology, or analogy potentially miss the point. These are not distinctions Paul would necessarily have made. When applied to ancient authors, these distinctions create unnecessary and potentially misleading analytical categories correspondences of all kinds were potentially significant and could be employed. Thus, the term typology here is intended to be heuristic. The reason why I'm kind of going through the stress of why, you know, the nature of typology 
is because when I do propose my standards later, uh, you know, some people might say, well, Swan, you know, so what I'm going to do is show examples of typology, right, that are in the scriptures. And some people, some people might say, well, Swan, this is circular because you have to know what typology is in order to know the examples. But Swan, you haven't given us the, the definition of typology. You're just giving us the examples, you know, and so that's kind of circular. What I'm saying here is, OK, from the outset, we can vaguely identify what typology is. Once I give you the examples, then I'll give you the precise um, you know, categories and, and precision that I think is necessary. So I, I, I kind of am in, in disagreement with Robinson here because I think, you know, maybe from the outset, Paul would not have used typology. You know, he wouldn't have, for instance, thought like typology is this one rigid thing. Maybe any correspondence for Paul would have been typology. But when we look in the corpus of the biblical literature, I think we can then start narrowing down what's typology, what's allegory, what's analogy. I hope that that explanation wasn't too confusing. Right. So, you know, I'm just trying to point out my methodology here. We can begin with just searching for correspondences in scripture, and then we can use how scripture uses those correspondence to delineate more precisely what is typology versus allegory. So, you know, um, Robinson offers this definition, at least for Markin typology. He says, in this limited sense, a Markin type is a correspondence between persons or events in the gospel with persons or events from scripture, which Mark has used in the composition of the gospel and which can be expected con to contain, excuse me, hermeneutical significance. Okay, so what are the examples then of typology given this kind of broad definition that I'm beginning with? And I'll use the scriptures then to get to a precise definition. So here are some uncontroversial examples of typology. You have, for example, the new Moses typology. Now, I'm introducing two categories here of the kinds of texts that are used for the New Moses typology. There's first the establishing text. The establishing text shows you that this is where you know the typology is being made. Then you can have consequent texts that, in a way, establish the typology between Moses and Jesus, but um, you know, you know, they could use the, the support of the establishing text to kind of show for a matter of fact that yes, there's a Moses typology going on here, right? So the establishing text is Deuteronomy 18, 15 and Acts 3, 22, 23. So Peter uh, in Acts 3 almost quotes verbatim um, to his Jewish audience, uh, Deuteronomy 18, 15, when he's justifying the messianic claims of Christ, although he adds a little bit in, in his um, sermon. But the point is that Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15, he gives this prophecy where he says, a prophet like me shall arise from among you, my countrymen, and to him you shall listen. Notice that Moses said, a prophet like me. Moses is simultaneously doing prophecy and setting up a typology. In Acts 3, 22, 23, Peter kind of catches, you know, Moses's prophecy and says, aha, and applies it to Jesus, right? Or, or rather, you know, he's showing that this is, in fact, who Jesus is. He is the new Moses, right? So we have this establishing text for the new Moses typology. Now we can actually go into the rest of the biblical narrative. And, you know, we might find correspondences between Moses and Jesus. And we can now know, given the establishing text, okay, yeah, we would expect then to find, you know, these correspondences given the fact that the typology is valid. So, for example, like in the transfiguration, right? Um, in Exodus 24, 15 to 18, Matthew 17, and Mark 9, 2 to 13. I mean, you see in both contexts, multiple correspondences, right? So for example, six days are mentioned. So after six days, then the, the at least in the New Testament, the transfiguration, in the Old Testament, Moses ascends the mountain with the elders or with the three main disciples. You see, you know, six days being mentioned. That's a very strong indicator that you have a correspondence going on when the exact same number of days in the Old and the New Testament events are, you know, connected. You also see that, you know, Moses ascends the mountain with three main disciples, um, Nahab, Abihu, and I forget the third one always. But then with the, within, um, you know, uh, the, the synoptics you have, um, or at least Matthew and Mark, you have um, John, Peter, and I believe it's James. Um, but I might be mistaken. Anyway, you have three main disciples, and then you have a cloud that speaks in both the Old and the New Testament. So these correspondences are clearly establishing Moses as a type and Jesus as the anti-type. And then given the establishing text, we can say for certain, yes, this is what we would expect 
in the rest of the biblical narrative. Or even the kind of innocuous phrase or kind of, you know, innocent phrase, sheep without a shepherd, right? You know, Joe Heschmeyer points this out in his book, Pope Peter, that this is also going to be a new Moses typology. Because the phrase is mentioned in Numbers 27, 16 to 17, when Moses is about to die and he prays to God, Lord, let appoint a successor so that my people will not be like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew 9, 36 and Mark 6, 34, when Jesus looks upon the people of Israel with pity, he says he looked upon them like sheep, like they were sheep without a shepherd, right? This establishes then Jesus as being corresponding to Moses because both of them are looking upon the children of Israel like they are sheep without a shepherd, right? So there's a natural substitution that goes on here between Moses and Jesus with this phrase. Likewise, we see, for example, the 70 elders in Numbers 11, 16 be, uh, are corresponded to in Luke 10, 1. Although some people believe that the, you know, th there might be a copyist error here because some translations will say 72. So maybe this isn't the best example, but the point being is that scholars, there are scholars who will argue, no, the number should be 70 given um, the new Moses typology, right? There might be a, the, the, the 72 might be a copyist error. But since we know that there is a new Moses typology, it's very likely that Luke meant 70 disciples and not simply 72. So notice there that typology is actually being used sometimes to actually help us get back to the original wording of the text of the New Testament. That's how powerful typology is. In John 3, 14 to 15, Jesus talks about how the Son of Man must be lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent. So this is interesting, right? Because... Um, you know, the action of being lifted up applies to both the bronze serpent and the son of man. And in verse 15, Jesus says, for the sake of, the, you know, saving the, the world, right? Just as the bronze serpent, you, if you were bitten by a poisonous snake, you had to look upon it in order to be saved from death, right? I mean, so we see a correspondence then, I think, not only between, um, you know, between Jesus and the bronze serpent, but you see a kind of gesture towards the Moses typology as well. Now before, you know, and I, I wasn't able to finish my paper on typology, but I also made an argument that there's a John, there's a John six uh, and there's a John six and uh, Exodus 16 typology that's going on here. Because in John six, you have, for instance, the mentioning of the Passover. Um, there's eventually in the bread of life discourse, talk of manna. In the previous, uh, before the Bread of Life discourse, you have um, the people talking about the prophet who is to come, right? The prophet obviously being an allusion back to Deuteronomy 18.15. And they even say, given this sign, you know, some of them came to, or the people came to believe that he was the prophet, right? Now the sign, what is the sign? Well, Jesus had just done the miracle of multiplication, the feeding of the 5,000. Um, in John 6, the people ask for a miracle or a sign like what they had received from their father, that their fathers had received in the Old Testament from Moses of the manna. So I think there's a clear, strong indication that Jesus in John 6 in the Bread of Life discourse is a new Moses because he's performed the sign, the miracle of the multiplication of the bread. He's fed his people. He's fed Israel just as Moses fed Israel from heaven and Jesus obviously being the bread from heaven as well. So, yeah, I mean, there obviously then you can see how correspondences can suddenly then become, you know, established typologies, right? That's another, okay. So with the Passover meal and the lamb, you see in John 1, 29, you know, Jesus is referred to as the lamb of God. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul, I think, refers to Christ as our Passover. Clearly in Romans 5, 14 and 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49, we have the second Adam typology. And even Paul literally says that um, that Adam was a type of him, of he who was to come, right? And he uses the word type or typos, which is where we get the word typology from. So I don't, that's as clear as you can get. You have Jonah in Jonah 117 being in the belly of the sea monster for three days. Ma Jesus says in Matthew 12, 40, so too must the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days, right? So you have this clear illusion and it's by virtue of the three days that you get the connection. And I think Jesus actually mentions Jonah as well. And so regardless, right, you see a typology going on between Jonah and Jesus, where what is done to Jonah in the Old Testament is done to Jesus in the New Testament, except in a slightly different context.
Jonah has to be in the belly of the sea monster for three days. Jesus has to be in the heart of the earth for three days. There's a natural substitution that occurs there. Or even 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22, which is largely regarded as a valid typology for, you know, the bapt uh, the flood of Noah being a precursor to baptism and how before the flood condemns in baptism were saved. Um, or Jesus and Eliakim in Isaiah 22, 22, Revelation 3, 7. Okay, so these examples of typology help us then get a better grasp of how exactly typology is being worked out in the New Testament. We see the correspondences, but we see other things like a natural substitution that occurs, right? You know, so for example, when we look at um, Exodus 16, Moses feeds Israel. In John 6, Jesus feeds Israel. Notice there's a natural substitution such that we can say Jesus is the new Moses. There are other things that I'm going to mention too. But let me get to some definitions of typology now that we've established examples, right? So here's what some scholars have said on the proper definition of typology or a type. R.T. France writes the following, quote, A type thus presents a pattern of the dealings of God with men that is followed in the antitype, when in the coming of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom, those dealings of God are repeated. Notice that it's not just Jesus Christ, but also the setting up of his kingdom. That will be relevant, obviously, with the Isaiah-Matthew parallel. Though with a fullness, and he does use one L there, I believe, and finality that they did not exhibit before. So France proposes that maybe there should be an escalation that occurs. And obviously there's, you know, um, there, there's some reason maybe to believe this. I know that, um, what is it, um, Craig L. Blomberg and others in Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics makes a similar argument that, you know, there's chorus, there's usually escalation that occurs between Old and New Testament typologies um, because the apologetic of the type in the, or anti-type in the New Testament is to show the superiority and the messianic claims of Christ and his church. Um, but other scholars have pointed out typology, uh, typology doesn't always require escalation. Okay. Now, I think escalation does occur in the case of the Isaiah Matthew typology, in that, as I mentioned before, Eliakim is compared to a collapsible peg. If you read later down, like eventually the peg is taken out. Whereas Peter's described as a rock, and in Jewish tradition, rocks are known as permanent objects that are immovable and secured. So, and I've argued this extensively elsewhere. So, I mean, escalation is a part of at least Old to New Testament typology, but typology in and of itself doesn't always require escalation. Likewise, Craig L. Blomberg, in his book, A Handbook of New Testament Exegesis, he says the following, quote, The best solution is to understand the ancient Jewish and Greek use of typology. The word typos means a pattern or model. Um, and if you go to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it's volume three or volume seven um, of 10. Um, it mentions how, you know, typos implies a kind of imprint or indent that's left behind. Usually in craftsmanship and, and, and work, you would have typos being used to refer to like when you make an indentation for something that is, you know, yet to come or be placed in. Um, but anyway, one helpful definition is the recognition of a correspondence between New and Old Testament events based on a conviction of the unchanging character of the principles of God's working and a consequent understanding and description of the New Testament event in terms of the Old Testament model. And there he's citing R.T. France in his 1985 InterVarsity commentary on Matthew. Um, in the theistic worldview of the ancient Mediterranean world, the assumption was that God revealed himself in consistent and discernible ways. For the Christian, it could not have been coincidence that just as the children of Israel had to come out of Egypt when God gave Moses the revelation on Mount Sinai, now again Jesus, the inaugurator of the new covenant, had to return to Israel from Egypt before he began his ministry. The same God must be disclosing himself in both contexts. And notice that jibes well with the syntactical correspondence between God speaking in the first person in Isaiah and God speaking in the first person in Matthew. The events of old are being filled full or given additional meaning, but, it's, but it is meaning consistent with and even analogous to the original meaning. The apologetic is less straightforward than with direct predicted prophecy and its fulfillment, but no less powerful. Likewise, Richard Onsworth, and this is who I meant to be the author of Joshua Typology in the New Testament. I think I might have called him David Onsworth or, you know, 
mis misstated the author's name. He says this, quote, with all these correspond what all these correspondences do have in common, and he does an extensive study of typology uh, of you know New Testament types, however, is at least implicitly the notion that they are all determined by the divine will. It is of the nature of God's providence that he should, as it were, stamp salvation history and the religious practices of his people with the character of his saving power, making them reflections of his heavenly glory. The correspondences are of the nature of things, revealed but not created by the way in which the Old Testament is written. This is why typology is not a form of exegesis. You can do typological exegesis insofar as you're trying to show that the biblical author is identifying a typology. You can do the typological exegesis that way. But typology is not, let's say, purely a, an exegetical exercise, right? That wouldn't be fair to the intent of how typology was used. It's saying that there's this thing that has happened that has been revealed, and then it's simply you know, shown to us from the biblical author's viewpoint through the text that they've given us. Okay, but the point I'm making with that is that the most important standard for validating a type is going to be divine intention or divine authorization. And this is, in fact, what I believe Walter Kaiser also argues in the New Testament use of the Old Testament. So the typology that uh, definition that I'm using then, given this study that I've done so far, is simply this. Typology is the divinely authored historical correspondence between an earlier prefigured type and later fulfilling anti-type, such that God's providence is made evident to his people. Okay, so let me just break down a few things. So it's divinely authored. It's a historical correspondence. And I maybe I should also put analogical, historical analogical correspondence. Although that's a lot of um, adjectives before correspondence. Um, between an earlier, so notice it's historical, prefigured. Now, what do I mean by prefigured? Now, some people might say, well, Swan, you, you critiqued Gavin Ortland's definition of typology because you said that the definition seems too perspective. And I still stand by that criticism because his argument was that the type sets up the anti-type. Now, there might be a more charitable way to understand that. But when he says the word sets up, that sounds prospective. But as other scholars have noted, for example, um, typology in scripture um, it's a, let me actually get the source so that I'm, I'm giving you the way that you can find it. In the book, Typology and Scripture by Richard M. Davidson, what he points out is that the old consensus was that typology always had to be prospective. That is that something in the Old Testament always had to somehow point, like say like, oh, this thing is going to be typologically played later, right? That's how it has to work. But scholars have noted that, no, actually, the New Testament sometimes will retrospectively say that something had prefigured the anti-type in the New Testament. And so it doesn't always have to be perspective. That, and so when I mean prefigured, I mean prefigured simply in the sense that either prospectively or ret retrospectively, the type foreshadow or the type kind of mirrors the uh, anti-type in the New Testament. It prefigures it. Doesn't That doesn't imply necessarily only being prospective. It can go in either direction. I hope that makes sense. And the later fulfilling anti-type. And so fulfilling can mean all sorts of things, right? It could mean maybe something like, you know, there's an escalation that's going on, or maybe simply fulfilling could just mean that the correspondence is there and that the old, that the prefigured type finally has found its correspondence in its New Testament anti-type, right? So that's all that fulfilling could mean. It doesn't necessarily imply escalation. The final thing that must be included is the reason why God manifests history typologically, and that is that his providence and his sovereignty is made evident to his people. It is directed to an audience. God wants his people to know, I am faithful, I am consistent, and I am the same God of your forefathers. For example, Roger David Oss points out in the among the rabbis, there's a saying, as it was with the first redeemer Moses, so it shall be with the last. Michael Fishbane points out another saying among the Jews, which was, what happened to the fathers was it meant to be a sign to their sons. So yeah, very clearly there's this idea of typology in Judaism, and it has an audience, and the audience is God's people to show the faithfulness of their God.
Okay, so here are my standards then for identifying typology. The first that you have to establish is textual appraisal. You cannot simply begin from a kind of conceptual apparatus like, oh, well, you know, conceptually speaking, Adam and Christ are kind of similar. And so that's how you establish the typology. No, you need text first. You need verification somehow from the text to justify making some type of connection or illusion, right? And so I, I say here, there must be textual features that warrant a connection between one passage of scripture and another, providing the scriptural bridge for a typological connection to be made. Okay. And I, I mean, I, I, you know, my, for my Protestant listeners, they're going to say, praise God, right? Like, yes, text first. And actually, yeah, praise God. Like for me, even, even as a Catholic, like I, I, I really do believe, yes, scripture is so important. Text comes first in many instances, right? Now, I don't think that the text can conflict with the magisterium and the tradition, the apostolic tradition of the fathers. So obviously then that's where the Protestant, my Protestant listeners might say, oh, well, okay, man, that's where we part ways. But no, I am very much about the text of scripture. I love the Bible. That's why I became Catholic. Okay. So you need to have textual appraisal, right? To begin making the typological connection. The second thing is that the type that you're proposing or the anti-type that you're proposing needs to have a natural substitution. I've used that word multiple a phrase multiple times. Here's the explanation. The anti-type must naturally substitute the type in the context or even the construction of the later passage. By context, I mean like, for example, you know, go back to Exodus 16 and John 6. In both contexts, you have Moses feeding Israel, you have Jesus feeding Israel, right? Okay, so there's a natural substitution that occurs in the context. Um, but then even in the construction of passages, you can find a natural substitution. So for example, when Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay, the natural substitution in the passage is that so as the as the serpent must be lifted up, okay, so the serpent's being the lifted object, so the Son of Man must be lifted. So even in the way that the text is presented, the Old Testament text, the New Testament, or even the way that Jesus presents that typology, he shows that in the construction of his sentence, yeah, where the serpent, what's going on with the serpent is going on with the Messiah. And so that's or the, the bronze serpent. That's how you can see the typology. There's a natural substitution. So it's either the context or the construction. The third thing is significant correspondences, right? So, you know, a correspondence, when you're pointing out that there are these kind of parallels between the old, uh, between the type and the anti-type, you know, the correspondences should not be trivial. And I got the standard from Walter Kaiser and Moises Silva. I, I believe it's Walter Kaiser and Moises Silva. Yep, it is. In their introduction to biblical hermeneutics. Where they point out, yeah, so if you're making, if you're establishing a type, you can't just have trivial correspondences, right? They have to, in a, uni this is me now, uniquely direct the reader to the type from the purported correspondence with the anti-type. Now, it's possible for correspondence to cluster, and that can also point to, then, a type. So, for ex uh, so let me give you an example of the former, right? So, you might have a case in which... Um, you know, for example, uh, for example, let me give you an example, uh, a, a bad example, Mo Jesus being a prophet. OK. Simply the fact that Jesus is a prophet does not establish the new Moses typology. Why? Because the fact that Jesus is a prophet, merely being a prophet is too many people were also prophets. That doesn't automatically mean they were the prophet that Moses was speaking about. But when the, um, the the people in John 6 say this is the prophet, you know, that was foretold, ah, that gets more specific, right? And so you want a correspondence to very specifically point back to something in the, the anti-type to point back to the type, right? So, for, you know, so, so now going back to this idea of correspondence is clustering, imagine for a moment that we did not have... Um, uh, we did not have Deuteronomy. Let's say we didn't have Acts 3, 22 to 23. So we don't ever have Peter actually directly quoting Deuteronomy 18, 15. But we had all the other examples of instances where we seem to see a new Moses typology. Could the type be established even without the establishing text? And the answer is absolutely yes. 
the typologies that occur between Jesus and Moses in the other passages, they are strong and they can all cluster together collectively to show that the type is definitely there. Um, now, of course, people might, you know, and one reason, you know, somebody might say, well, I mean, Swan, the reason why those work is because those correspondences are really good. They're really strong. But then again, I think in the book of Psalms, it's describing Israel as sheep without a shepherd, right? So someone might say, oh, well, that doesn't show with enough specificity that it's a Moses typology being played on in Matthew and Mark. Maybe it's just the Psalms being repeated. But I think we have good reasons for believing that, no, there's a, there's this, it's in the context of Jesus looking upon Israel. And in Numbers, we see the same context repeated again. So the correspondence might not have 100% narrow precision back to one and only one text, but we can establish that, okay, there's a good reason to believe probabilistically that the correspondence between the type and the anti-type, or excuse me, that the, the correspondence in the anti-type is pointing back to the type. And I hope that wasn't too confusing, but, you know, basically to summarize my point here, you usually want the correspondence that you're proposing between the type and the anti-type to be significant enough that, yeah, you could see how it points back uniquely to the, the anti-type points back uniquely to the type that you're proposing. The second thing is that you could have correspondences cluster and thus increase the probability that the type is, uh, that the anti-type is going back to the type. All right. Obviously, number four being one of the, the most important is divine intent, right? So there needs to be some way in which you can show that the typology that you're proposing has divine approval or authorization. And how do you do that? Well, you have, for example, you could use covenants to establish that if God has made a deliberate promise to his people and he has this motivation or intention to remain consistent in his dealings, perhaps a typology could be established with reference to a covenantal context. Perhaps you could establish a typology through prophecies, right? So obviously these are both kind of prospective in a way. They're, they're going from the old and pointing forward to the new. But remember I said before, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way always. For example, in the New Testament, you could have explicit validation of a typology occurring. And since the New Testament is also the word of God, you could have that be basically as a way of establishing divine intent if the New Testament author makes it sufficiently clear that he wants to establish something in the new going back to the old, right? So explicit validation could be a way of getting divine intent. The fifth thing that I want to point out is authorial motivation. Now, authorial motivation is not necessarily the same as authorial intent. What I'm simply trying to establish Establish here, and you know, uh, G.K. Beale calls this kind of conceptual idea correspondence, I believe, or he focuses on on how concepts might align between a, a type and anti-type. The point is that you you know you at least want to establish that the author has conceivable motives for wanting to identify a typological correspondence, right? So, you know, for instance, with the typology between Isaiah and Ma uh, Isaiah and Revelation, G.K. Beale argues in his book on the Handbook of the New Testament Use of the Old. That, you know, yeah, it makes sense that John would want to make a correspondence here because, you know, Eliakim has the key of the house of David. And so why wouldn't Jesus have it? Right. So this could be a way of establishing authorial motivation. OK, so these are my five standards for identifying typology. So let's see how well the Peter Eliakim typology holds up. One is that you do have textual appraisal. I've established that there is a textual illusion. You also do have a clear natural substitution given the syntactical correspondences that I previously showed. I'll get to significant correspondences because I think that there are many, both in terms of unique correspondences and clusters that occur, but I'll establish that. There's divine intent insofar as you both have the Davidic covenant where God says that he will establish the house and the kingdom of this foretold son of David who will establish you know, the kingdom forever. And so you have this theme then of rebuilding the Davidic kingdom. I think the covenant can be established, uh, can give us divine intent for this typology. Moreover, I think that given the strong evidence that we have for the textual appraisal um, from Matthew of an Isaiah 22 illusion, you have explicit validation for there being a divine intent here for an illusion and a Peter Eliakim typology given natural substitution. Okay, then you have authorial motivation, right? So I think clearly 
and I'm going to show this even in the next slide, I think. But you clearly have, re and I've given the reasons constantly for why, you know, Matthew would want to invoke Isaiah and why he would want to maybe make a Peter Eliakim typology, given the fact that Jesus is the son of David and is rebuilding his father's kingdom. And so if you have Jesus literally resurrecting an office from the Davidic monarchy and bringing it into the new covenant kingdom, that actually enhances the case that, no, Jesus was very self-aware that he was rebuilding his father's kingdom. That is his father, David. Okay, so significant correspondences, right? Um, so I think you have, for example, the fact that Eliakim and Peter are always first on the lists in which they appear. I think uh, 2 Kings 18.8 is one example that is cited. Um, but I, I, I even have other scriptural examples later on. But Eliakim is always presented first on the list of the king's servants whenever he appears with other servants. Likewise, Peter is always first in the list of the 12 disciples. And as Dale Allison points out in the Oxford Bible Commentary, you know, this is not merely first on the list, but first in terms of privilege status. Matthew calls him obviously protos, first principal or chief. The only time that Peter does not appear first on the list and he appears second is in Galatians 2.9 after James, the brother of Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, but in terms of the Gospels, Peter always appears first. In terms of um, the fact that both Peter and Eliakim are compared to objects, I think that's significant. I, I don't think that's just an accident. The fact that Eliakim and Peter have similar contrasting powers, open, shut, bind, loose. The fact that you have a thematic correspondence of, of, of Eliakim replacing Shebna, Peter perhaps replacing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see Eliakim and Peter both being referenced as, you know, the sons uh, of their respective fathers, right? I think that's also significant. Um, you see Eliakim have his dynasty fall apart when you read, I think, in verse 25 when the peg is removed. Um, you see in Peter that after he gives this great declaration and, and you know, allegedly this, uh, well, well the, uh, the Isaiah 22 illusion occurs, he rebukes Christ, Right you have a similar rise and fall motif. And obviously in both the old and the new, you have Eliakim and Peter serving the Davidic king. And so I think that these can serve both as examples of significant correspondence and authorial motivation, however you frame it. Um, but yeah, I definitely think then that we do have good correspondences between both Peter and Eliakim. So, um, I want to go and take a brief aside here and just mention that the kind of methodology that I've done to defend a Peter Eliakim typology is very similar to how other scholars are right now in the literature establishing typologies between Joshua, Isaac, uh, uh, Joshua and Isaac to Jesus. So if you're wondering, like, where did Swan get this idea from his methodology? I was mainly inspired by Pablo uh, Gaudens' paper, The Akeda and the Crucifixion, Isaac Typology in Luke's Gospel. But all three scholars in their works, you know, Richard Onsworth, uh, Leroy Huizenga, and uh, Gedens, they all use Richard Hayes's um, textual allusion standard to begin at least making a case for how Jesus might be a new Isaac, a new Joshua. And so the method that I'm using is also quite standard. It's not exactly the same as what they're doing. I think I, I, my, my approach maybe matches more Gadenz's approach, but still I'm saying that the, the argumentative mode that I'm using, the dialectic, the, the structure is similar to what other scholars have done. If you want to verify and look at how these men have established typologies between Christ and Joshua and Isaac. So looking back then, yeah, I think we clearly do have significant correspondences between Peter and Eliakim. And even we do have scholars who have noted, yeah, there is a typology between Peter and Eliakim. So once again, going back to Benedict Green in his commentary on Matthew, he says, quote, the Old Testament type for Peter here is Eliakim, the principal officer in the court of the Davidic king, not merely the controller of the royal household, but the vestigerant in the kingdom. And thus the, the, the salia, whose actions, I might have pronounced that wrong, whose actions bind his principle. What Eliakim is to be to the kingdom of Judah, as distinct from the palace, Peter is to be to the kingdom of heaven, as distinct from the church. Uh, his role is concerned with admission to the final eschatological reign. I want to point out here um, 
I forgot this guy's name, Yajun Yuan, or um, I think he, a particular commenter under my videos. He's tried to make a he's tried to argue. Well, look, there's a distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the church. I want to acknowledge that yes, there is a distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the church. The kingdom of heaven refers to, or the kingdom of God refers to, is an eschatological idea, meaning the end of the world when God finally institutes once again His cosmic temple over the entire cosmos, right? Um, but the church is the earthly agent by which the kingdom of God is being en enters and breaks into reality, right? So there is a distinction, but there's also overlap between the two. And so I want to put that out there and why I don't think it's problematic that the kingdom of heaven and the church have some distinction, but they also definitely overlap. Okay, even uh, Benedict Viviano, a Dominican friar. Uh, who's also a respected New Testament scholar. So, you know, please don't dismiss him because he's Catholic. He says, quote, The point here is that as Aaron serves as Moses' spokesperson and assistant, so Shebna and, Eli and later Eliakim serve as stewards or prime ministers to the Davidite king, and Peter as authorized lieutenant in the etymological sense a placeholder or locum tenens. So he's saying, you know, G Peter is the vicar of Christ to Jesus. It is a case of mosaic and Davidite typology, but among the characters of secondary rank. So we have a secondary typology going on here. Jesus, of course, being the primary typological character. Um, but regardless, we have typology being claimed between Peter and Eliakim in the academic literature. So now I want to show you premise three, why the best explanation is not a Jesus Eliakim typology or similar functions of the keys here in the Matthew 16, 19 passage. You know, so I'm not denying that there's a Jesus Eliakim typology in Revelation. I'm saying here in Matthew, that's not what's going on. And I'll offer three reasons. First, let's go back to the standard of natural substitution. Second, let's look at the nature of Christ's response. And third, we can actually harmonize the fact that there's a Jesus Eliakim typology and a Peter Eliakim typology. So first, natural substitution. Let's go back to the syntactical correspondences that I presented. Notice that you have God in both contexts. Um, you have the correspondences between the keys, the house of David, the kingdom of heaven, and the recipient of the keys in both Isaiah and Matthew. It's, it's Eliakim and Isaiah. It's Peter and Matthew. The natural substitution for the one receiving the keys is Peter and Eliakim. That's how we know that the typology, as I explained before, given other scriptural examples, that's how we know that the typology more naturally applies to Peter, uh, between Peter and Eliakim, and not Christ in this example. Because Christ here is being represented as the builder. He's being represented as the one who gives, not the one who receives, whereas Eliakim is definitely in the Old Testament the one who receives. So to give you a quote from Oscar Kuhlmann, he writes the following, quote, just as in Isaiah 22, 22, the Lord lays the keys of the house of David on the shoulders of his servant Eliakim. Okay, Old Testament. So Jesus commits to Peter the keys of his house, the kingdom of heaven, and thereby installs him as administrator of the house. There exists a relation between the house of the ecclesia, whose building was mentioned just before, and whose foundation, Oscar Kuhlmann, Lutheran scholar, defends that Peter's the rock, and the heavenly house whose keys he receives. And I want to point out here, too, that um, it's really it, so I, you know, don't try to defend the entire papacy just on Matthew 16, 18, with Peter being the rock, even though that's established among scholars. And I've looked into the academic arguments. I've looked into popular arguments. I it's simply, I, you know, Catholics, we we have nothing to worry about in terms of the fact that Peter is the rock of the church in 1618. We have people like D.A. Carson, Oscar Kuhlmann. Um, uh, you know, and others who have defended, um, you know, th this this translation, uh, this uh, this interpretation of Peter as the rock. Christer Stendhal in the Peaks Commentary in the Bible, noting that it's mainly Protestant bias that has prevented people from identifying what seems to be the obvious. And Christer Stendhal, I believe, was a professor at Harvard, and he was a Lutheran, so he was not have any. He did not have any acts to uh, any reason to defend the Catholic interpretation. So anyway. Um, what we see here with the Oscar Kuhlmann quote is he shows the natural substitution between the Lord giving the keys of the house of David to Eliakim and Jesus giving the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter. 
the natural substitution is undeniable, is laid out by the scholars. Second, we have the nature of Christ's response. It is a declaration about the person of Peter. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus being the speaker is making a claim about the person, the identity, the nature of Peter. And that's why the type in the New Testament that is being played here is going to have to be Peter. Let me show you why. So R.T. France in his commentary in the Gospel of Matthew, um, he writes, quote, the wordplay and the whole structure of the passage demands that this verse is every bit as much about Jesus' declaration about Peter as verse 16 was Peter's declaration about Jesus. Notice what's going on here. When Peter gives his confession or declaration about Jesus, Jesus then gives his declaration about Peter. Let me give you more examples, though. So going back to R.T. France again, quote, the Greek phrasing of this declaration, when compared with that of verse 16, conveys a reciprocity, which can be rendered in English only by heavy over translation. Simon has declared, you are the Messiah, to which Jesus now responds. And I, in turn, have a de declaration for you. You are Peter. Each naming also goes on to mention the Father, Son of the living God, Son of Jonah. Messiah was a title for implied fun uh, for which implied a functional role, though that has not yet been spelled out. Now Jesus gives to Simon a title, a nickname, which, like the famous renamings in the Old Testament, Abram, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, Jacob, Israel, also speaks of his future future role. Excuse me, and that role is spelled out in verses eighteen to nineteen. Now I will point out that. Um, some scholars have made the argument, I can't remember off the top of my head who it was, that P, that Jesus, even though he's speaking in the future tense, it doesn't exclude the present giving of the keys as well to Peter. Um, because the, the, the translation would be something like, I will to give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, right? Well, technically that could be both present and future, but that's an aside, right? The point is that uh, France is showing that in the grammar of the declaration back to Peter, Jesus is revealing the identity of Peter. He's doing something direct to the person. Likewise, David Turner in his commentary on Matthew, he says, quote, Jesus is speaking of Peter in 1618, just as clearly as Peter is speaking of Jesus in 1616. Likewise, W.D. Davies and Dale Allison and their critical com and exegetical commentary on the gospel, according to St. Matthew, they also provide arguments for why the declaration uh, uh, of Peter to Christ is now being from Christ to Peter. In the grammar, they write, quote, you are Peter matches you are the Christ. And they show in the Greek how similar words are used in Matthew both times. And just as Peter spoke revelation, so now does Jesus. Moreover, given the fact that we know that 18, 1618 refers to Peter, we also cannot separate 17 and 19 from the fact that all of this is being said to Peter as one exegetical or yeah, one unit. So more significantly, verse 19 cannot be isolated from verses 17 and 18. And in these last, Peter is spoken of in terms not applicable to anyone else. So notice that these scholars are arguing, not Catholic scholars, that yes, Jesus is now giving a declaration about the identity of Peter. So that's how we know that the typology not only has a syntactical correspondence between Peter and Eliakim, but Jesus is saying, 1619, it's, I'm making this about Peter. Jesus being the master builder, being the kingdom, being the king of the Davidic kingdom, is now making this emphasis on Peter and his role in his kingdom. Moreover, I should mention that there are natural ways of harmonizing um, the fact that you have a Peter Eliakim typology and a Jesus Eliakim typology. So, you know, Patrick Gray, as I mentioned before, in his 2017 Rutledge uh, Guidebook to the New Testament, he mentions that, you know, the house of David belonged to the king. And so in Revelation 3.7, it's not problematic that Jesus has the keys because he has the, well, one is that it's interesting because in Revelation 3.7, it doesn't says he has the key of the house of David. It says he has the key of David. That's interesting because then if he has the key of David, I mean, he has it right as the Davidic king. Whereas Peter, it seems to be the case with the kingdom of heaven and the house of David. 
He has in the context of a kingdom, whereas Jesus has simply the key of David, not the key of the house of David, simply the key of David. I mean, there might be a reason why John shortened and just said the key of David. But the point being is that the key belongs to Jesus. And so it's not problematic that Jesus would have the key later. But Jesus has given the keys to Peter as well. Now, it's not the case that he has the keys, uh, that Jesus gives the keys to Peter in a zero-sum way, where if Peter has the keys, then Jesus can't have the keys. That is a false uh, dichotomy. Uh, moreover, uh, uh, you know, when we look at, for example, how images and typologies are applied in their immediate context, we can affirm that in the immediate context of Matthew's gospel, Peter has the keys. In the immediate context of Revelation, Jesus has the keys. There is no conflict here. In fact, D.A. Carson makes this very point when he's defending the fact that even though Christ is described as the cornerstone, Peter can also be the rock of the church. Here's what Carson says, quote, The objection that Peter considers Jesus the rock is insubstantial because metaphors are commonly used variously until they become stereotyped, and sometimes even then. Here, Jesus builds his church. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul is an expert builder. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, Jesus is the church's foundation. In Ephesians 2.19-20, the apostles and prophets are the foundation, and Jesus is the cornerstone. Here, Jesus has the keys. In Revela uh, here, Peter has the keys. In Revelation 1.18.3.7, Jesus has the keys. In John 9.5, Jesus is the light of the world. In Matthew 5.14, his disciples are. None of these pairs threatens Jesus' uniqueness. They simply show how metaphors must be interpreted primarily with reference to their immediate context. I couldn't have said it better than D.A. Carson. So now to premise seven. But the textual allusions being a Peter, and I think I've established, therefore, that this is a Peter like in typology since we've eliminated the other two options. But the textual allusions being a Peter like in typology is much more expected on the hypothesis that the papacy is true than on its negation. And so I want to defend this premise with three different observations. The first is that Eliakim's office corresponds quite well to Vatican I claims of papal supremacy and infallibility. The second is that Petrine typology is highly unexpected under a Protestant or even maybe even Orthodox interpret or view of scripture. Peter gets his own typology. Peter was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. That is incredibly significant. The third thing is that when we look at what's the most plausible interpretation of Matthew 16, 19, in light of Isaiah 22, 22, we find that with the Peter Eliakim typology, it means that in some way, Peter received authority like Eliakim's. And if that's the case, then combining all these arguments together, that fits really well with the papacy. So let me just describe now Eliakim's office, and this is going to go into some detail. We're going to talk about Eliakim in scripture. Eliakim's connection to Joseph in the Old Test in the book of Genesis, the fact that this office is priestly, the office was supreme in nature, it was successional in nature, um, and then I'm going to conclude by once again kind of tying the knot and or you know tying the thread and discussing Eliakim's office, you know, showing why all these come together. So we see Isaiah, uh, we see Eliakim primarily in two places. It's in Isaiah and Second Kings. In 2 Kings, Eliakim is acting as the chief uh, diplomatic envoy before the Assyrian king. And both times, um, Eliakim, uh, always Eliakim is listed first among the other servants. And we see here that Shebna, who originally was in the position of Eliakim as the chief steward of the king, is demoted into the position of a scribe. Um, and so, you know, I have the citations here. I don't think I need to read them through and through. But it's interesting that when uh, when the Assyrian Rob Sheka responds to Eliakim, he doesn't respond or when he responds to Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah, he doesn't respond in um, the singular, or excuse me, in the plural. He responds with a singular you, right? I mean, so maybe that refers to them as a group, but I think what's going on here is that Eliakim was the main speaker. Obviously, with Shebna being the scribe and Joah's role not being terribly fleshed out um or the secretary right shebna the scribe 
um, and then with Hilkiah in charge of the household, Hilkiah was the primary one doing the negotiations and representing King Hezekiah before the Assyrians to prevent the assault from occurring on Jerusalem. And so even what's interesting too, just to point this out in verse 26, um, you know, Eliakim asked the Assyrians to speak in Aramaic because that's the language they understand. And Jesus spoke uh, Matthew 16, 19 in Aramaic. I just thought that was interesting that Eliakim and Aramaic have a connection. Um, so yes, yeah, so Eliakim here is not only chief steward, you know, he's in charge of the household. He's also acting as the chief international diplomat and representative of the king, whereas Shebna and Joah have a subordinate role as scribe and secretary. We also see in 2 Kings 19, 1 to 2, you know, that, um, you know, Eliakim, once again, who's always mentioned as in charge of the household, right, gives the report to Hezekiah, and Hezekiah tears his clothes when he hears that the Assyrians are, you know, they have every intention to destroy Jerusalem. Um, in Isaiah 36, 3, uh, verse 11 and verse 22, again in 37 and uh, chapter 37, verse 2, Eliakim is mentioned again, and I believe in each of those instances, he's always mentioned with his office as in charge of the household of the king. Um, and the other time he's mentioned is Isaiah 22, 22. Okay, so Eliakim is definitely a significant figure. Um, and I should also mention too, just going back really quick, um, I'm going to mention this later on, but I want to mention it now. It's interesting because, uh, you know, in, in these kind of military negotiations, we would expect Hezekiah's um, commander of the army to actually be present. But Nilly Sasher Fox, in her book, In Service to the King, she points out that it's very likely that what happened was that the mass, that the um, commander of Hezekiah's army had died. And so Eliakim, being the international diplomatic envoy, the master of the palace, also assumes the role of the master of the army or the commander of the army. And so Eliakim's office could expand over other offices and administrations. He had more jurisdiction and could even, if you will, cover other people's offices in the kingdom. I mean, that's very fascinating because some people complain, well, the Bishop of Rome should just be the Bishop of Rome and not the Bishop of, let's say, a local diocese. But at least it seems here that he, that Eliakim could act beyond just his jurisdictional office and expand into other jurisdictions. But that's just an aside, you know, that might be a stretch, but that's something that I want to mention. Okay. And then obviously if you have questions about, okay, Swan, but you know, do other people mention the importance of Eliakim in the uh, archeological literature on um, the old Testament? Yes. So you have here in this book by Adele Reinhardt's, you know, the fact that Eliakim is the son, or excuse me, was in charge of the palace. And so other people mention, you know, the importance of Eliakim in the literature on the Old Testament. So I'm using the, the fact that he's in charge of the palace to begin making a connection to Joseph. Now, um, I don't want to get bogged down in the details on, you know, was Joseph vizier in the in Egypt or was he, you know, some other office? I just want to point out that there are strong also connections between Eliakim and Joseph that might be the background for understanding the position that Eliakim eventually enjoys. So I'm quoting here now from the archaeologist Roland DeVoe in his really uh, staple, you know, work, um, Ancient Israel, Its Life and Institutions. If I'm not mistaken, he was one of the first, um, or, or I, I shouldn't go too far, but he, Roland DeVoe is a very important scholar in terms of the literature on ancient Israel and the study of its institutions and in life. So here, here's what he says, quote, in Israel, the powers of the master of the palace were far more extensive, and the similarity between his functions and those of the Egyptian vizier is even more important than the verbal resemblances. This vizier used to report every morning to the pharaoh and receive his instructions. He saw the opening of the gates of the royal house. Um, that is, of the various officers of the palace. And then the official day began. All the affairs of the land passed through his hands. All important documents received his seal. All the officials were under his orders. He really governed in the pharaoh's name and acted for him in his absence. This is obviously the dignity which Joseph exercised, according to Genesis. He had no one above him except the Pharaoh, and he was appointed over the whole land of Egypt. He held the royal seal, and to describe his dignity, the Bible says that the Pharaoh put him in charge of his house. He made him, in fact, 
his master of the palace. Going on, the master of the palace had similar functions at the court of Judah. Announcing the promotion of Eliakim, Isaiah 22, 22 says, you know, I lay the key of the house of David upon his shoulder. If he opens, no one will shut. If he shuts, no one will open. The Egyptian vizier's instructions are described in a very similar fashion. Every morning, the vizier will send someone to open the gates of the, excuse me, the gates of the king's house to admit those who have to enter and to send out those who have to go out. One is reminded of our Lord's words to Peter, the vizier of the kingdom of heaven. Like the Egyptian vizier, the master of the palace was the highest official in the state. His name comes first in the list of 2 Kings 18.18. 18. He alone appears with the king, 1 Kings 18.3. And Yotham bears this title when he acts as regent of the kingdom, 2 Kings 15.5, as the vizier did in the absence of the pharaoh. Okay, so DeVoe makes an argument that uh, that the office of the master of the palace was modeled after Joseph's office under the pharaoh in Egypt as vizier. So um, there, there might be some criticism here because not the, the the consensus of scholars on this issue, or at least most of them, they don't agree that um, the office that Joseph had was one of vizier. But what you know, but obviously DeVoe is offering an argument here, and it doesn't. What what matters is not so much that Joseph had this office of vizier. That's a kind of a, a minute, specific detail. What matters is that Joseph, uh, that Eliakim's office echoes of Joseph's position under Pharaoh. Um, and likewise, in my own uh, re research on this, in my article on Catholic Answers, if I may cite myself shamelessly, um, you know, I make the point that recall that all of Pharaoh's possessions, including his own house or palace, were placed under Joseph's care. Eliakim is similarly described as over the king's house. Um, some translations will call him the overseer, so they'll kind of ram, all, you know, and I think the Hebrew actually rams it all together. But other translations will definitely say that Eliakim was over the king's house. Some will just say he was the overseer, right? So it depends on the translation. So I was using a particular one there. As its master or chief steward. So let's look at some of these passages, right? So I'm using the JPS Tanakh, Genesis 39.5. And it came to pass... From the time, oh, from the time that he appointed him as overseer. So sorry, that applies to Joseph, not to Eliakim. Um, in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptians' house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. In Second Kings nineteen two, for example, it says, "And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos." Now, what I did here was I highlighted the Hebrew because if you go on Bible Hub, and I know like I was critiqued for using Strong's Greek, but I think it's at least significant that if you go on Bible Hub and you look at the words that are used here, you'll find that both of the words used for, you know, Eliakim over the household, uh, Joseph being overseer over his house, the Hebrew there, they're variations of each other. They're similar words in, in, in their, I guess, I don't want to be too, I want to be careful here, in their roots, perhaps. Um, I know Louis D, uh, Dion, who good friend of mine, he probably probably can master the Hebrew better than I can. But the point is that the Hebrews, the Hebrew that is used here, are not disconnected from each other. There's yeah. definitely a connection that is going on or a variation of the same idea. Okay, so let me see. I just checked the stream again to make sure that everything is still functioning properly. I see something about a final end. So teleology is being mentioned. Very interesting. Um, okay, so Genesis 45, 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither. Oh, this is the JPS Tanakh translation again. But God, and he hath made me a fa father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Remember that in Isaiah 22, 21, Eliakim is also called father. And I will clothe him with thy robe and bind him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I mean, notice that Eliakim literally receives the government of Israel on himself. And then he's called the, inha he's called the father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, so Andy Mettinger, he makes us, I got this argument from him on page 77, because he's saying here that in both contexts, Joseph and Eliakim are called fathers. 
over their respective jurisdictions. That's incredibly significant, um, not only because it shows that there might be a connection between, there's strange connections between Joseph and Eliakim, but also, I mean, you know, uh, you can't really say, like, if Jesus in the New Testament says, call no man father, um, well, you know, Eliakim was called a father. But anyway, that's kind of a bit cheeky. Let me just focus on the Old Testament, right? The point is that you have um, a similarity between Joseph and Eliakim. And if we can see how powerful Joseph was, that reveals even further how powerful Eliakim was. And if Eliakim is the type for Peter, that reveals even more how powerful Peter is in the New Testament, given the typology. So likewise, Menninger, once again, on page 77 of his work, Solomonic State Officials, he says, quote, against this background, it becomes rather difficult to assume that the circles in Jerusalem that handed on this piece of literature regarded the office of the Israelite house minister as something fundamentally different from that of Joseph. Now, I remember Gavin, uh, you know, kind of rebutted in our original debate, and I responded to him since on Reason and Theology, where I offered, um, you know, a response to him. And then I created an updated version where I responded or I received Gavin's emails about my response. And then I updated it, you know, to be more fair to Gavin. But I want to mention once again, and I haven't heard a response from Gavin. I understand he's busy. But the fact that, he, you know, he asked the question, why would there be an Egyptian office in Israel? Well, the reason why is because we would expect, given the fact that the Israelites were in Egypt once, that they would continue certain practices or ideas from that they had inherited in Egypt. And what we find is actually this in multiple other contexts, increasing the probability here once again. So, for example, uh, David Falk, who appeared on Captioning Christianity with Karen Bertuzzi under the video, This Egyptologist Has Strong Evidence for a Real Exodus, he notes multiple ways in which you can show in Israel and in the Old Testament allusions back to Egyptian practices that show or strongly indicate that Israel was in fact once in Egypt. And I think this is a perfect candidate. The other thing that I should point out, at least, okay, and I need to be careful here, at least what I think it shows is an allusion back to Joseph's time in Egypt. Is it precisely a reincarnation of the office of vizier? Maybe not. Maybe what happens is the office of house minister or master of the palace or chief steward increases to the point that then it later becomes modeled after Joseph's office as vizier or maybe something else, you know, um, Menninger proposes perhaps uh, the great house minister in Egypt, which was another title, not necessarily the vizier. The point I'm simply making here is that, okay, we this is not surprising that we would see this connection back to Joseph in Egypt. Even Menninger suggests that the word afad, which Eliakim wears in verse 21, might be of Egyptian origin. Okay, so that increases then we have might maybe a Joseph illusion. Um, and obviously, if you uh, if you read the book, The Old Testament, Use of the Old Testament, it, the Old Testament does quote itself. So this is not an absurd proposal that I'm making up. Um, the other thing I want to say, too, is that, you know, so I think there were Joseph slash Egypt inspired influences on the description of the chief steward's office in the biblical text, especially in Eliakim's case. OK, so now I just want to go into some questions and limits because. Recently, you know, DeVoe and Medinger's work has been heavily criticized by Nilly Sasher Fox in her book, In the Service of the King, which I referenced earlier. Um, and so there needs to be some nuance introduced here because, and I, you know, because some people are going to pick up the source and they're going to look at it and say, oh, Swan, this destroys your entire thesis. So anticipating people looking into this book and somehow trying to destroy my thesis, let me anticipate and respond. So the thing that we know that everybody agrees on is that Joseph received an incredible degree of authority under Pharaoh. But it is unknown if his office is vizier, great house overseer, or an entirely unique office. Um, the vizier hypothesis has largely been dismissed. The great house overseer has more credence. Um, Fox proposed that perhaps that this is Joseph received an entirely distinct new office that has no antecedents. Or, or uh, nor antecedents or, you know, later consequence in the history of Egypt. Now, Fox does mention that there are similar offices among Israel's neighbors from whom Israel could have taken inspiration as well, right? And so I'm not, we shouldn't think that just because there might be some allusions back to Joseph's time in Egypt that we can't look at the other Ugaritic evidence for this office 
um, you know, in, in, in Assyria and other parts of Mesopotamia, right? Um, I, you know, so I don't want to dismiss that. Um, the other thing too is that, um, you know, so I just, I'm, what I'm simply defending here is that Isaiah's description of Eliakim's authority echoes Joseph's position. Now, maybe DeVoe's stance is too strong, right? My argument doesn't hinge upon DeVoe necessarily being correct that Joseph was busier. And as I mentioned before, Mettinger's thesis is more accepted. Fox notes this, or it, it's more plausible, I should say. The chief steward's authority was certainly over the king's palace complex, you know, um, and could, but could be extended statewide, right? So Eliakim's authority might have originally been over the palace and the king's complexes, um, but eventually it gets expanded onto other complexes and other facets of the state. I mean, we, I think we clearly see that in Eliakim's case. So as I mentioned before, Eliakim certainly acted as diplomat and military commander. And I mentioned before how Hezekiah's commander of the army is strangely absent during the negotiations with the Assyrians. And Eliakim instead acts as the head of that delegation, substituting the him being in the office of chief steward and also covering the office of somebody else. I mean, this is also similar to how Jotham, who was um, uh, you know, a chief steward, could also serve as the king when the king was incapacitated. So it's interesting, this office was intrinsically flexible of the chief steward to cover whatever the kingdom needed. It had a kind of, if you will, unlimited jurisdiction. Finally, Eliakim's tenure constitutes the highest point of the chief steward's authority. He is the right-hand man of Hezekiah's kingdom. You know, Fox points out how I think in second, uh, you know, when Solomon lists out his um, king, his the offices in his kingdom, I think it's in Second Kings six. Um, you see that the chief steward is listed eighth in the list, but later on, that same steward I believe is listed first, and then as more time passes, the chief steward is always kind of listed as the first rank and the chief officer. Um, I think what we see here, and Fox actually says this, is a development over time in the Davidic monarchy that Davidic monarchy denoting the monarchies that followed in the vein of the house of David, um, that the, the, the king, the, the position of this prime minister or chief steward does gradually develop and expand, um, to use an analogy that I hope is not too, um, comical or that is unprofessional, you know, think about, for instance, um, you know, Batman and, and, and his Alfred and his Butler Alfred, right. You, you see how the, how Alfred is kind of like this chief butler. And there are other, of course, other workers in Wayne Manor, but eventually Alfred kind of becomes this kind of second right-hand man, right? In, in terms of like, you know, what Bruce Wayne does. And so I'm using that analogy. I know it's kind of silly, but using the analogy, the point is that Eliakim is like this chief butler who eventually gets entrusted with the king's most intimate personal uh, administration of the kingdom. Right. I think that's how the office developed gradually over time. You had the you had the chief steward acting as originally kind of just the chief butler of the house. And then eventually, because he's always next to the king, he's managing the most important properties of the king. He's you know charging who can enter and not enter the palace. He becomes elevated into this position of being the right hand man of the king. OK, so. Now that I've established kind of these facts about Eliakim's office, let me go into the fact that Eliakim's office was priestly. And this is in direct response to some of the arguments that Gavin Ortland gave for why Eliakim's office is not priestly. So let me go over the sources that I originally mentioned. And the reason why I'm saying previous sources here is because I have new sources and new arguments as well. So I mentioned last time um, in the work of, uh, of G.K. Beale, edi edited by D.A. Carson, he notes in the book, The Temple and the Church's Mission, that it was Isaiah 22, 22 portrays Eliakim, prime minister to King Hezekiah. And I know that uh, Gavin critiqued me for calling him prime minister, but as you've seen multiple times throughout the literature, scholars have no problem calling him prime minister. And so I will continue calling him prime minister as having the key of the house of David on his shoulder because he controlled who could enter into the king's presence and service. There were priestly connotations associated with Eliakim's kingly administration, since Isaiah 22, 21 portrays him clothed with a tunic and a sash securely about him. The Aramaic translation of Isaiah 22, 22 says that God will place the key of the sanctuary and the authority of the house of David in his hand. And then Isaiah 22, 24 of the Aramaic version says that even Eliakim's relatives will be priests wearing the ephod, 
So notice here that among the Jew the Jewish reception of Isaiah was that Eliakim was a kind of priest. That was the reception of the Jewish people of Eliakim's office, historically speaking. The other thing to point out is that given what Eliakim is wearing, this does imply something of a priestly connotation. Now, I know that Gavin said that he doesn't think a priestly connotation is enough. I'll respond to that in due time. But these were the sources I cited last time. There was also John Oswalt's commentary on the book of Isaiah, where he notes that Eliakim will wear the badges of honor and carry out the functions assigned to him. And notice that Oswalt cites Genesis with uh, Joseph. Evidently, the prime minister, at least, and perhaps other high court officials wore special uniforms. The terms here used for robe and sash appear elsewhere only for garb worn by the priests. This does not mean necessarily that the court officers had usurped the prerogatives of the priests, but rather that there were standard terms for ceremonial clothing. Now, Gavin responded in over email and said that he believes that Eliakim is not a priest and that the tunic and uh, what he's wearing is just standard ceremonial clothing. It doesn't imply anything about Eliakim being a priest or uh, of that sort, right? Well, I mean, I'm going to get into the nuances of how I respond to that objection, but I want you to note that at least what Eliakim is wearing is only typically applied to priests, and then in later Jewish reception, Eliakim and his relatives were viewed as priests. So that's interesting to point out. The other thing I should mention, too, is that there was not a neat distinction between church and state in ancient Israel. And I want to thank Seraphim Hamilton, as I did previously in the beginning and in the previous response to Gavin, um, for pointing this out to me. Right, Because even David, the king, could take on priestly prerogatives. He could do things that only priests could do. And so there was not a neat distinction between priest and king, or rather between David's office as king and his ability to be priest in ancient Israel. Um, and, uh, and anybody who studied the Old Testament knows what I'm talking about here in terms of the fact that there was not a neat distinction between church and state and how even the temple was the primordial model for government in ancient Israel. I mean, for example, I cite First Chronicles 9, 27, where we see the, the priests are described as having keys for opening the temple, which sounds awfully similar to what is going on in the case of Isaiah 22, 22. Um, although I, I think there is a distinction that needs to be maintained to some extent between the two. But the point is that it's not a sharp total distinction. Another point to mention is that even with things like the Urim and the Thummim in the Old Testament, um, which Moses receives, and hands on to his brother Aaron and to the other high priests, uh, the Urim and the Thummim, this means by which the people of God, or rather the priests, could directly discern the divine will and receive a direct answer from God on questions concerning justice and the management of Israel, or even the interpretation of scripture. Um, uh, the Urim and the Thummim eventually is used by Saul, I believe in the book of Samuel, and so it's interesting here, first or second, what's interesting here is that Saul is not a priest, or Saul is a king, right, the first king of Israel, and he's not typically conceived of as a priest, and yet he's maybe he's using the Urim and Thummim himself, or he brings a priest along with him when they're trying to figure out who had sinned against God, and eventually it's discovered through the Urim and the Thummim that it was Jonathan, Saul's son. The point I'm mentioning here is that there seems to even be before David this idea that the king was something of a priestly figure. And so even those in the civil administration of government were not distinct from the religious cult. Cult just referring to the, you know, the religious congregation doesn't mean cult in a bad way. Now let me go to some new sources that I have here. So um, this is from, I believe, Rucker's book. Let me see. No, this is from Patrick Barber's paper, Jesus as the Davidic Temple Builder and Peter's Priestly Role in Matthew. Here's what Barber says, quote, What is frequently overlooked, however, is the fact that there are several indications that Isaiah 22, 22 was understood as describing Eliakim as a priestly figure. In fact, that Eliakim was seen as a priestly figure is clear from the Targum, that is the Aramaic translation on Isaiah 22. He is given a turban, verse 18, and said to wear a cincture, verse 21, and receives the key of the sanctuary, verse 22. Likewise, the Midrash Rabbah specifically identifies Shebna, the man whose office Eliakim takes, as the high priest. 
How did ancient interpreters uh, come to the conclusion that Eliakim was a priestly figure? This view appears to be rooted in the language of the Hebrew text of Isaiah 22 itself. Okay, so no longer the Targums or the Septuagint. We're going right to the Hebrew. Eliakim is portrayed as wearing the garments, a tunic and a sash. Um, yeah, Isaiah 22, 21. Two garments specifically associated with the high priest, Exodus 28, 4. Now, I want to break here because um, in response to when I first made this argument of capturing Christianity, Gavin cited Exodus 28 against me to show that Eliakim doesn't have the full repertoire of what the priest wears. One possibility is that uh, the high priest, the, so the garments that are being described there only belong to the high priest because this is referring to Moses talking to, Exodus, uh, to Aaron and his descendants. It's possible that Eliakim only has some of the garments because he's not high priest, but maybe a lower class priest, you know, but still a priest nonetheless, or priestly in some way. Now, of course, Barber is making the argument here for that, okay, Eliakim might have been a, the high priest. That's um, a bit more, you know, contentious perhaps, but still it's the arguments being made by a scholar. Indeed, Eliakim's role in the sanctuary may be suggested by Isaiah 22, 24, where the vessels, um, let's see, where he is given authority over every small vessel from the cups to all the flagons. Such table vessels appear elsewhere in context describing the cult, the religious, you know, community and ceremonies, especially in connection with descriptions of the table of the bread of presence. And the, the numbers there were footnotes that I didn't properly translate into, you know, a superscript. That the LXX additionally speaks of Eliakim's being crowned probably also relates to high priestly imagery, since we learn from other Jewish sources that the high priest was crowned. Given the high priestly language associated with Eliakim's role in Isaiah 22, it is probably significant that the imagery of keys, which are also associated with Eliakim in Isaiah 22, had previously had priestly associations in ancient Israel. In 1, Corinthians, uh, in 1 Chronicles 9.27, the priest's responsibilities involve the key of the temple. Okay? So there's one, multiple lines of arguments that you could use to show that Eliakim has something of a priestly office. Likewise, Mettinger notes, the other allusions to the solemn act of investiture point to the high rank of the house minister. He gets a long robe, and for his girdle, the text uses a word which is otherwise used, especially in connection with priestly apparel. So the fact that you, you, you only have this word used for priests, and then you have one exception um, in this one case for Eliakim, to me, the balance of the probability leans towards the idea that Eliakim, in some sense, had a unique connection to the priesthood. Not that, oh, tunic, and, you know, for example, if we just take the ceremonial robe interpretation that, oh, you know, like, you know, wearing a tunic and a girdle or robe and a sash or um, there are other translations for those two words. Oh, that this is just standard ceremonial attire. Then why is it the case that at least one of the things that Eliakim is wearing is only always associated with priests and only this one time referred to by someone who I guess might not be a priest at all. You know, it seems more likely that Eliakim is a priest of some sort, given how often um, I believe it's the, the girdle is used to refer to, or the sash is used to refer to uh, 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 only priests wearing that particular item. Um, so let me see. For example, um, going back to G.K. Beale in the same book, uh, uh, temp The Temple and the Church's Mission, likewise, the Jewish commentary, the Midrash Rabbah Exodus 37.1, me, understands Eliakim in Isaiah 22.23 to be a high priest, right? So even in Jewish thought, Eliakim was conceived of as a high priest, although immediately the Mid admittedly, the Midrash Rabbah comes a bit later, if I'm not mistaken, in the Jewish histories. So let me now even go to more sources. So uh, Timothy Rucker in his book, once again, he writes, quote, Nevertheless, only priests wear a sash in every other occurrence in the Hebrew Bible. Thus, Prakasam argues, Eliakim's investiture with robe and sash in Isaiah 22, 21 indicates that his authority was not merely over the royal house, but over the house of God, the temple. And I'm actually in full agreement here that uh, with Prakasam's thesis, I don't think that Eliakim was just over the temple or just over the royal house. I think he had jurisdiction over both 
in some capacity. I think the primary role of his was over the royal house, but clearly I think there are priestly or maybe temple connotations. Likewise, Rucker continues, the pairing of tunic with a sash increases the likelihood of a temple background. A tunic belongs to a priest in about half of its instances in the Hebrew Bible. Although the presence of a tunic in 2221 does not necessitate a temple background, its pairing with a sash is exclusive to priests. For example, he compares Exodus 28.4 with Isaiah 22.21. I mean, I, the evidence just keeps on mounting that, okay, there's something priestly going on with Eliakim. Um, and that the thesis that this is just a separate type of ceremonial wear that mimics the priests, that doesn't make sense. What's going on here, I think, is that the priestly image of the sash, which is usually only associated with the priesthood, and even the robe being paired with the sash, is some type of allusion to the priesthood. Likewise, on page 95, he says, quote, in regard to the Hebrew text of 2215 to 25, the strongest piece of evidence for a temple background are the sash, the tunic, and the turban wrapping. These three, along with the key, so notice that all four of these things are coming together, comprise the four pegs of the Mesopotamian loom for the temple tapestry. Within the context of this loom, many other terms and phrases may be seen to contribute to temple connotations. So what he's pointing out here, I think, is that in other kind of Mesopotamian context, you see all four of these objects come together to represent what priests and other kingdoms would have been doing during, during this time, right? So obviously Israel was inspired somewhat by her neighbors. Um, but yeah, I, you, you just the, the convergences and the multiple ways and the multiple attestation of scholars on this point, I think um, effectively together constitute a definitive reputation of the idea that Eliakim was totally disconnected from the priesthood. And I want to say that, you know, if, if if Dr. Ortland ever presents this objection again, I really want you to be ready with all these sources to present them and ask the questions that need to be asked. And I want to say to you that if you ever, you know, if you ever want to compare something that Gavin and I say, look at my sources and look at the scholarship, okay? Because there have been multiple instances where, you know, I've been accused of, oh, you know, like for instance, like that's exactly what a Roman Catholic would say in the context of, for example, when I said that Peter came back to, Peter disappears from the narrative in Acts 12, but he comes back in Acts 15 because he was on missionary duty. And Gavin said, of course, is what a Catholic would say. And I'm like, no, if you look in the literature, Ajith Fernando and uh, Craig Keener explain why Peter is missing, at least between those three chapters. Now, I do sound a little upset because I was upset during the time when this was kind of dismissed. And so I hope now, even though I am young, I don't have a PhD, you know, like, like Dr. Ortland and others, I hope that I won't be dismissed and that I will be taken seriously with the arguments and the hours of research that I poured into this. Anyway, now we know that Eliakim's office was supreme in nature. So, for example, Fox, despite her heavy criticisms of Menninger and, um, and of uh, DeVoe, she says it is generally agreed upon that occupants of this office were administrators of the highest status. So regardless, they were of the highest status. Um, regardless of what kind of authority the chief steward might have had. The jurisdiction of this official in Israel and elsewhere could cross administrative divisions when deemed appropriate. So the, the, the jurisdiction of the chief steward could go beyond just the palace. There was a sense in which it had a flexibility and could expand into other things. Now, this is more directed towards my Orthodox brothers and sisters who might say, well, Swan, no, the Bishop of Rome should only stay in his diocese. Well, Eli you could say, well, Eliakim should only stay in his diocese of the palace, and yet Eliakim expands into other offices or other dioceses, if you will. Right. So I'm, I'm saying here that, um, but even still, Eliakim's uh, office is described as a universal authority, but I'll get to that later. Um, the point is that, okay, this office was quite flexible. It could expand and could do things that whatever it needed to do to preserve the kingdom. Now, uh, at least up to the point of Eliakim. Eliakim, I think, represents the high point of this chief steward's office. Fox, however, does deny that the chief steward was second to the king or had authority over other officials. Now, I think it's a bit strange that she would say that, you know, they don't have the, the, the chief steward doesn't have authority over other officials, because if he's the one with the highest administrative status or the highest administrators of the highest status, presumably he would have authority over those who don't have the highest status.
or even second to the king, right? I think that if you take Isaiah 22, 22, where Eliakim says, you know, where instead of Eliakim, whatever he opens, none shall shut, whatever he shuts, none shall open. That's a pretty definitive authority that would at least suggest at minimum, perhaps an authority equal to the king or second to the king above everybody else. Moreover, I do take issue uh, with some of her arguments because sometimes I do think that they're a bit rigid and I do, but, but, but we, I think we both acknowledge that the office probably evolved over time and gained greater authority in the Davidic house. And with Eliakim being kind of the cherry on top, go back to my example of how that happened with, but with the Alfred being the butler and you know, all that. For example, she says that the Genesis account of Joseph is legendary. For me as a Christian, for me as someone who accepts the inspiration of scripture, no, I, I mean, maybe there are, there's hyperbole being done in Pharaoh's description of the office of Pharaoh, uh, the office of Joseph, but I'm, I don't want to call the Bible legendary um, in like a, in a, the connotation that she's implying um, of kind of being like kind of unreliable in its description. Um, I, I, for me, I, I, I don't feel at liberty to do that. I accept the authority of scripture. Um, I accept the Bible as the word of God. And also, I think that her position kind of conflicts with Isaiah's descriptions of Eliakim, because as I mentioned before, she doesn't believe that the steward was second to the king, and she largely considers Isaiah's oracle too, uh, too poetic to be really substantial. But if it's in the case of a prophecy directly from God himself, then God can use poetic language if he wants, but the point that he's getting across, the meaning is clear that Eliakim does have a definitive authority. And so due to my submission to God and to the scriptures, um, to the word of God, uh, there, are parts, there are ways that I'm going to part with uh, Sasher Fox's argument. And I know that, for example, some of those who are more kind of liberal in the scholarship are going to kind of laugh at me for doing that. But for me, as someone who accepts the authority of scripture or who believes that no prophecy was real and definitely from God, I'm, I'm not in a position to, to say it's legendary or unreliable. So, and as I mentioned before, right, this idea of when Isaiah says none shall shut, none shall open. Well, when we look at, for instance, the New Bible Commentary, it agrees with my interpretation here. The shutting and opening mean the power to make decisions <clears throat> which no one under the king could override. This is the background of the commission to Peter and to the church. So notice the authority of Eliakim is definitive. Likewise, let's look at Eliakim's jurisdiction. Isaiah 22, 21, and he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now, one thing I should point out, and I mentioned this in my Catholic Answers article, Where's the Papacy in the Old Testament? During this time, Israel was split in half. Now, the half that was still technically Israel, you know, Judah, um, it, you know, it, it, it had King Hezekiah, whereas I believe it was the north was occupied by the Assyrians or the Babel, uh, I think it was the Assyrians. And so technically speaking, all that was Israel, all that belonged to the sovereignty of the king was under Eliakim's jurisdiction. So there can be no doubt that Eliakim had universal jurisdiction over Israel, given what it's saying here in Isaiah 22, 21. Now, I do want to mention another thing, too, which is that an, there's another illustration of the height of authority that the chief steward's office could enjoy. And it was it's in mentioned in 2 Kings 15, 5, where Jotham replaces his father, Azariah, who is the king, um, and covers him because he was smote as a leper. So it says here, and the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a house set apart. And Jotham, the king's son, who uh, was over the household, judging, or in some translations, governing the people of the land. Now, I mentioned the Hebrew again because it's very similar to the Hebrew that's used to describe Eliakim's authority and even the authority of Joseph over um, the house of Pharaoh. Now, uh, Sasha Fox kind of has some objections to this because she doesn't think Jotham was acting as the master of the palace. She thinks it was simply describing how Jotham took over over the household as um, you know the son of the king and co-regent, not as the master of the palace. I want to say two things, right? First is that here's one possibility. Although Azariah was technically still king, Jotham fills his father's role since he was already master of the palace or he becomes master of the palace in his father's absence, right? I mean, after all, it says, and Jotham the king um, was over the household. We don't know exactly when the jurisdiction began. It's possible that what happens is since Jotham was already the master of the palace, 
already governing his father's properties and being his right-hand man, he naturally gets elevated into co-regent. The other possibility is that maybe Jotham is not in the office of the master of the palace, but his actions show what authority was possessed by such an individual through the same described action. So for example, let's say that Jotham wasn't a master of the palace. Regardless, what we see here is that if he's described as over the household, and Fox notes that the authority that he's using here is the authority of the king, of judging or governing the people of the land, if Eliakim is also over the household, then Jotham here gives a kind of clue to the extent of authority that Eliakim had. It was an authority equal, if not second in command to the king himself. And so once again, that's another way that I'm disagreeing with Sasher Fox based on the witness of scripture. Eliakim's office was successional in nature. So we have here Roland DeVoe's succession list in his book on page 129. We have Ahishar under Solomon, Arsa, I think Azra is how it's otherwise translated under Ella, uh, Obadiah or Obadi Obadiyahu under Ahab, and Yotham under Ozias, and Shebna and Eliakim under Hezekiah. And also I should mention too that this office does appear, okay, in first, not second Kings, first Kings 4, 6 under Solomon's administration and continues onward to the biblical narrative up to Hezekiah. So this was an office that was consistently there in the Old Testament. It's unfortunate that a lot of people don't know about it, but it's there in the Bible. Now, I just want to mention briefly that Look, Eliakim's office eventually does end, um, you know, and so um, it does end after the dynasty kind of falls apart. Willis believes that the peg and the mentioning the relatives is an allusion to the fact that maybe Eliakim begins to um, accept bribes from his family members. And that's why Eliakim is deposed. Some people don't think that some people just think that Eliakim's office ends when the Assyrians attack um, and then it needs to be picked up. Some people have argued, for example, that just as the reign of the sons of David ended, it, it it kind of points to needing to be picked up again in the new covenant. And so Jesus picks up the line. He picks off where the story left off. And likewise, it could be the case here, given the nature of our Davidic king, the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus is picking up the office of Eliakim and continuing it with Peter. Um, and then also, you know, there are questions about Petrine succession. So, for example... Were there actually successors to Peter's Episcopal office um, or, 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 you know, were there successors to Peter in Rome? I've dealt with that question on, um, on, on Michael Lofton's channel, Reason and Theology, the case for Mana Episcopacy. And so I just think here what I want to say is that Eliakim's office, or at least the typology, it doesn't entail successors, but it anticipates or makes probable and unsurprising that there would be claims of succession to Eliakim's anti-type Peter in the New Covenant. So at least, if you will, the type sets in potency succession. And I think the history of the early church actualizes that potency and shows that there were successors to Peter's office. One thing that I should mention, though, is that people often will say, well, you know, the succession from Peter was uh, in, in the Episcopal office of Rome. Uh, these successions were kind of in the Greek school of thought in terms of being a philosophical succession of the handing down of doctrine, right? And so, I mean, to some extent, like, I don't reject this idea because I think you would want to show a consistent Episcopal line um, from the apostle who founded your church to the present day to show, okay, yeah, we, we've kept the office. We kept the, the preaching of the, of the message that was given to us, right? Um, I don't have any problem with the Episcopal succession lists of Hegesippus and Irenaeus appearing sort of kind of Greek in that way of handing on doctrine. That's not incompatible with what we believe as Catholics. But the point I want to mention is that I believe it's either Hegesippus or Irenaeus who mentions the deacon of one of the popes, and then later that deacon becomes the pope. To me, I think that's a semblance that there's something Jewish going on too in this idea of succession. Because um, ordination, the laying on of hands, was something that would occur to authorize somebody to be, speak. And oftentimes it would be in the case of a rabbi, a senior rabbi, elevating his student. And we know that uh, to vote on the Sanhedrin or to speak on the Sanhedrin. Likewise, we know that in the case of the bishop, his right-hand man was the deacon, was a kind of assistant. And so if we actually have an example, I believe, I guess uh, Irenaeus is quite clear about this, that at least if the bishops of Rome were selected from among a specific 
Episcopal class and their deacons were always the next in line, right? Um, their deacons were selected. Then actually, this is both a Greek and a Jewish idea coming together. The Greek idea of handing on doctrine faithfully and the Jewish idea of a senior rabbi elevating his younger rabbi into a position of authority. In the case of, for example, the senior rabbi being the bishop, the younger rabbi being the deacon, who is eventually elevated into succession. Now, I, I know I'm going, um, I'm going a bit long on this, but that, that's something I wanted to mention. Okay, this does make sense of Petrine succession, or anticipates it. When it comes to um, the other parts, I want to focus on Rome now and infallibility. So let's focus first on infallibility. So in Catholic thought, what you have to understand is that the chief kind of governing idea behind the idea of infallibility is that there is a definitive or unchangeable permanent ruling that is made at the core of infallibility. And that's why, you know, God inserts this protection so that, you know, the church will not be definitively bound to error. Infallibility is understood in Catholicism as a negative gift where God protects the church from error when she has to make these definitive, unchangeable rulings to permanently define and give definition to the apostolic deposit and the church in turn. So we see, for example, in um, the First Vatican Council, it's described how when the Pope says something ex cathedra, defines something in the apostolic deposit of the faith, it says, therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church irreformable. They are definitive. They are final. The authority of the Pope does not come from the church voting and saying, oh, yeah, we agree with you, right? Bishop, Bishop Gasser refuted that interpretation. Um, the idea here is that, you know, the Pope is speaking on the authority handed to him by Christ through Peter with the inspiration and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And thus, what makes it in what what's part of this idea of infallibility is also irreformability. I like take even the indefectibility of the church, right, or the universal consent of the fathers. There's this idea that it has this definitive, permanent character, and so God will not allow His church to be bound to error definitively, permanently, or universally, right? And so here. The idea is, okay, the core idea of infallibility, the seed, the, the root idea of infallibility is really irreformability or definitiveness. The question that now arises is could Eliakim make definitive rulings? And the answer is absolutely yes. Whatever he opens, none shall shut. Whatever he shuts, none shall open. We have the precursor then for something like an ex cathedra declaration. Could he make a saying on doctrine? Uh, could he make a doctrine concerning faith and morals? Well, let's look carefully here. So, in the case of Jotham, who was also a previous chief steward, he had the power of judging the people. In 2 Kings 15 5, he had judicial powers. So, uh, Fox notes on page 85, footnote 15, Kogan and Tadmore also note that Jotham took over his father's judicial duties. If this is the case, then he would be interpreting and applying the scriptures in a civil context. So he would also have to apply, you know, the Torah, the law of Moses over the kingdom when he'd be judging cases. And remember, you know, Solomon, for instance, had to judge cases. The king was something like a supreme court, uh, a supreme judge in the land. And so um, Jotham, being the master of the palace, uh, you know, it, it obtains this role as kind of the supreme judge of the land. And recall, you know, that, you know, well, there's multiple things, but recall my arguments for the Jewish precursor to the magisterium. Remember, I argued in, in my research that the Old Testament antecedent to the magisterium of the Catholic Church is this idea that Moses in the Old Testament built a judicial system for Israel, and Israel throughout the Old Testament maintained that judicial structure they, they varied it to some extent, you know, given the time and context, but they maintained a judicial system that could interpret and apply the Torah. And so actually, if my arguments for the magisterium work that at least this is the Jewish precursor, then Jotham and the chief steward falls in line as also being someone who has this ability to be a supreme judge in the court of Israel. And so this actually fits very beautifully with my arguments, if this is the precursor to what we have in the magisterium.
Now, I, I also want to quote D.A. Carson in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, because he even says, quote, But if it is translated as the future perfect shall have been bound in Matthew 16, 19, the passage could be taken to support the notion that the disciple Peter must therefore enjoy infallible communication from God in every question of binding and loosing. This is what D.A. Carson is saying in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, both in 1984 and I believe the latest edition um, I forgot what year it was published, but it's the latest edition from Zondervan Academic. Um, Carson notes that it can be interpreted this way. And I should also mention here that obviously Carson is not going to be, you know, he's not a Roman Catholic. People are going to say, Swan, you're misrepresenting Carson. Let me try to put all the nuance here so that I show, okay, yeah, Carson does not side with this interpretation, but he's saying it is a possible interpretation. And so hopefully there I'm not accused of misrepresenting D.A. Carson here. You know, because obviously he's a Protestant. He's, you know, he's not going to accept maybe papal infallibility. Likewise, I want to quote here Charles Talbert because there's a question on, okay, look, if we say that the tenses mean um, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and the idea is that Peter only binds what has already been bound in heaven, the idea is that not that Peter binds and then heaven has to begrudgingly follow, but that Peter only binds what has already been bound in heaven. What we see here then is a question on, okay, I know in my interactions with Dr. Stephen Nemesh and, and when I was on his channel, he made the argument that, you know, maybe the connection is in a sense accidental, but not intrinsic. Whereas I was making the argument here, no, I think there, there's something of infallibility going on here. There's an intrinsic connection in the idea that whatever, uh, whatever, um, actually, let me back up a little bit. So Dr. Nemesh's interpretation is that, yeah, Peter will only bind what is bound in heaven, and God does this by just making it so obvious to Peter what he must do and to everybody else that um, it's not analogous to how the later magisterium would do things. Whereas what I believe here is going on is you have, sure, you have the public dispensation of, of the gospel or the public saying of the gospel, you know, the public sources, but God, in a sense, is intimately helping Peter synthesize and have the correct rulings when he binds and looses so that he will not be in error. So, for example, let me go to Charles Talbert in, the, in his commentary in Matthew. He says, quote, The translation will have been bound, such loose in heaven, represents in Greek a paraphrastic future perfect passive. Traditionally, this has been interpreted to mean not that heaven ratifies Peter's judgment, but that Peter's judgment reflects what God has already determined. Stanley Porter has tried to overturn this reading. He argues that Greek tenses carry no inherent temporal dimension. Instead, there are three aspects, perfective, imperfective, and stative. Only context can determine the temporal dimension. The basic problem with this contention is that the Greek contains both imperfect and pluperfect tenses. Why these extra tenses if Porter's thesis is correct? Furthermore, the traditional reading accurately reflects the theological context of the first gospel. Like the prophet Nathan, the prophet Jesus announces God's forgiveness of sin. Like their master Jesus, Peter and the other disciples reflect the discernment that God has given to them. It is with the traditional reading that this commentary sides. When Peter interprets, it is a reflection of what, God, what has been revealed to him. Okay, now strictly speaking, at this point, this might not be incompatible with what Dr. Nemesh is saying. I just want to say here that there is an intimate connection between when Peter binds and looses and what has already been done in heaven. Peter only binds and looses in accordance with heaven. So, you know, to defend this kind of divine causality interpretation, where I believe that it's the divine protecting Peter from error in every instance of binding and loosing, recall that in Matthew 16, 17, we see that um, Jesus reveals to Peter that it was God the Father who helped Peter say the correct confession about the nature of Christ. And even if Peter didn't fully understand what he was saying, given what Willis has argued, Peter was able to say the correct thing. That's amazing, given the fact that God is using Peter to channel his own divine his own divine power through Peter uh, to give that correct confession. And recall what Salterini said on page 1037 of the Erdman's commentary on the Bible. Um, when Jesus says, you know, this was, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter is not exercising any human power here 
He's not synthesizing evidence on his own. He's not using any of his human ordinary faculties. Through God, uh, by God's power, Peter is being channeled to give the correct confession. Or even, you know, and so for example, when I talked to Dr. Nimesh on this particular point, he argued that maybe something like, you know, God the Father revealed to Peter um, this point, you know, not prophetically, but perhaps through kind of like, you know, the miracles that Jesus performed. And eventually, you know, it came together for Peter at that moment, right? A kind of aha moment. Now, for me, one is that an aha moment kind of strikes me as Peter kind of still relying upon his own human faculties, because you and I can have aha moments. We don't have these prophetic declarations, um, not all the time, at least. Um, and the second thing is that if that were the case, then why does Jesus say God the Father reveals to Peter? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense that if it's the miracles of Jesus that eventually get synthesized in Peter's aha moment, that it's God the Son who reveals to Peter the truth about Christ, right? I mean, that seems to be more naturally expected. Now, of course, I think uh, Dr. Nimesh can rebut that, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's God the Father working through the Son, and thereby it's still the miracles of Jesus that get into Peter's aha moment, and thus um, Jesus can still say it's God the Father who reveals this to Peter. Now, I just want to say that, the you know, the, or the usual trans uh, interpretation of this passage was that Peter received something like prophetic revelation. And even in fact, we see in Peter's dream in Acts 10, 9 to 16, when Peter has the dream to declare all foods clean, that God is also divinely assisting him to come to the direct correct rulings on his ministry and what to do with the Gentiles. In fact, Eckhart Schnabel in his commentary in the book of Acts, he says, quote, regarding Acts chapter five, Luke describes Peter as the spokesman of the apostles who have just received Ananias's gift. He also describes Peter as having the gift of prophecy, which allows him to see into Ananias' heart something only God can do, Hebrews 4.13. Remember in the Ananias and Sapphira case, the Christians are called to give their property to the Jerusalem church. And what ends up happening is Ananias and Sapphira withhold them, some of their property. And the people are surprised when Peter rebukes Ananias and Sapphira. Apparently, these wealthy members had great respect in the community. And Peter seems to know somehow that they've hoarded their property. And he even issues kind of almost an anathema upon Ananias and Sapphira and rebukes them in the name of God. You know, he says that you haven't just offended men, you've offended God. And so all this suggests a kind of divine power and authority being channeled through Peter at this moment to make sure that he can make this declaration. So in total, then, I think that if we look at the balance of the evidence on the fact that Peter retained this gift of prophecy and could be guided to give divine revelation, um, this seems to be a strong indication then that um, there is a kind of divine causality where it's not simply accidental that Peter, if you will, comes to the, the correct ruling. Um, I should also just mention a few other things because um, I know that Dr. Nimesh might reject to me characterizing his position as accidental. And if that's the case, then I do apologize. Um, let me try and kind of still show why I don't side with his interpretation upon these particular things. The first is that let's say, I remember I asked Dr. Nimesh the question, could the apostles bind and loose incorrectly? And there he kind of I don't recall his answer fully, but I do recall kind of him having to kind of think about and chew on it for a little bit. For me, there's no question. Yeah, the, the apostles are not going to bind and loose incorrectly. If we understand binding and loosing as their official halakhic teachings, which are issued um, when they, is for example, write scripture. And obviously they were infallible when they wrote scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired them to give an inerrant text. Um, the other thing, too, is that, you know, Dr. Nimesh might argue, oh, but this is not analogous to the later magisterium. Because God constantly makes public, you know, that that P what Peter's ruling is going to be or, or that what Peter's ruling ought to be even to other people and not simply just Peter alone. Whereas when the magisterium has made rulings throughout history, it seems to be the case that it's highly controversial. The magisterium is kind of using its own mind and interpretation. I want to say that I disagree with that view because, you know, even in the case throughout history and throughout church history, the apostolic deposit has always been public, Right what's contained in the scriptures and the tradition and the consistent teaching of the magisterium and the fathers. So in that sense, then you could say, yeah, it's analogous actually to what Pete, what's going on with Peter because the revelation about the Gentiles was given publicly by Christ. It's given publicly elsewhere. You can consider this how in the later magisterium, 
the, the apostolic deposit is also public. God is still performing miracles in the church. But in these controversial moments where the church needs to make a decision, Peter receives a dream. So notice that God is help, even though God has made the deposit of the faith public, he still reveals to the apostles through dreams or through prophetic visions what the correct ruling is on the matter. And so likewise, I would say that um, in the case and, and even in the case of, you know, Peter, his ruling was controversial. It did not have universal acceptance. There were even in Acts chapter 15, Pharisees and other Jewish Christians who thought that the Jewish law had to be maintained. And even who believed that Jesus taught the heightening of the Mosaic law, not its removal. And so actually from the very beginning, when the magisterium has made rulings in the Christian church, it has always been controversial, even with the public deposit of the faith being given by God through revelation and through um, visions. And so regardless, what I want to say here is that sometimes when I hear Protestant objections to infallibility, I'm a bit worried that they prove too much. I mean, there's this idea, right, that humans are so intrinsically corrupt or maybe imperfect that God can't make them infallible. Or if he does, it's only God incarnate. But I mean, the whole theme of the New Testament, of the incarnation, is that God, even the Old Testament, is that God is lifting up men to himself. He's lifting them up to divinity. Moses is described as Elohim in the Old Testament. In the intertestamental literature, uh, or excuse me, in the Testament of Moses, Moses is described by the Jews as being able to count the stars of heaven, something only God can do. In the Gospel of Mark, um, in the Gospel of Mark, the forgiveness of sins is a proof of the deity of Christ. In John 20, 23, Jesus gives that power to the apostles. In 1 John, it is said that we shall see Christ face to face, for we shall see him as he is, for we shall be made like him. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says that we will be partakers of the divine nature. And so all of these things are not surprising given the theology of the Bible, that God is lifting up men to himself and giving them powers that on their own they do not have. In fact, we have multiple, I think, Old Testament precursors for infallibility. Whenever a prophet is consulted or whenever the priest uses the Urim and the Thummim to answer the questions of the people to get to the correct answer on a particular mystery or matter. In fact, you know, I remember, um, you know, Gavin kind of said, well, you know, God always expected the people to be obedient, to follow his word. There was no official office by which they could have their issues settled. I mean, I think the office of the priesthood is actually the best candidate because multiple times, like, for instance, in the restoration of the kingdom under Josiah, Josiah asked the uh, priest to inquire or ask of God, you know, what is to be done. The priest somehow had a direct, immediate connection to God, and they could channel his rulings. But of course, there are instances, I believe 1 Samuel 28, 6 is the instance, where if they were acting immorally, then God would withhold his answer. I mean, but likewise, in the history of the church, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a pope who's immoral declare something ex cathedra. Usually the evil, the, the bad popes have no interest in doctrine or dogma. And I believe that the, that God has protected the church. And so even in the case of God withholding divine revelation from the Urim and Thummim due to immorality, it doesn't actually do away with the fact that he still used the priesthood to channel his authority. And one final objection someone might have is, well, you know, Swan, um, well, Swan, uh, you said that infallibility is a negative gift. All this sounds pretty positive in the sense that God is channeling direct divine positive authority through a human person. What I shall say here is that even though infallibility is understood as a negative gift, there is a positive dimension in terms of God's predestination and foreknowledge of events. Because God ensures throughout history that when, so God in his foreknowledge foreknew that when the church would make a definitive ruling, he would ensure that it would not be in error. So even the negative definition of infallibility has something of a positive component to it with respect to the divine predestination and foreknowledge of God. Um, I'm trying to think, well, you know, and the other thing too I should say is that, you know, if you accept that God would not allow the apostles to bind and loose incorrectly, but you try to reject a divine causality interpretation, then I think that's mistaken. Because I think God, even like if, if God gave the apostles the power to bind and loose, and God knew that they would not bind and loose, that they would bind and loose correctly, 
right? Then there is a sense in which God in his divine causality, in his predestination and providence is ensuring that the apostles would never bind and loose incorrectly. So that's why you can't say that it's just an accidental connection, that it, every time maybe it just so happens that the apostles get it right. Moreover, you can't say something more like what Dr. Nimesh is saying, where it's more disconnected um, or, you know, I, I mean, I definitely do think that there is a positive sense in which God is helping the apostles directly to correct, to come to the correct rulings, even if they don't always know that, in fact, God is the one behind the scenes working on them. I mean, for example, when Caiaphas gives a prophecy in John eleven fifty one to 52, he seems to not fully understand the words he's saying, but still God is working in the background. And Peter says this, but he doesn't fully understand what he's saying. God is working in the background to ensure that the apostles do come to this correct ruling, um, do uh, make sure that they are guiding the church properly. And so the other point that Dr. Nimesh will make is that what's going on in the New Testament is not analogous to the later magisterium. And I, I effectively said, no, I think that's wrong. I think it's actually very harmonious and evident with what's going on in the later magisterium. The rulings of the magisterium, even the act of the Council of Jerusalem, were controversial. There were divisions. People interpreted the gospel differently. But nonetheless, God, through his public revelation, which eventually becomes the apostolic deposit of the magisterium of the church of all of us, becomes, you know, um, the magisterium can make rulings on the apostolic deposit just as it did in the Council of Jerusalem. Where exactly does Rome come in? Well, I think it comes in the case that what we see is that the bearer of the royal as opposed to private title is always attested in the biblical text in connection with a king or a capital city. So this is argued by Neely Sasher Fox. For example, Eliakim is linked with Jerusalem. So notice that this prime minister is always associated with a king or a capital city. Well, what we know is that in at least the messianic thought of the Jews during the time of Christ, and even leading up to the time of Christ, a lot of messianic significance was placed upon the capital city of Rome. To quote, a more traditional account of the Messiah is found in 4th Ezra 11 to 12. Here he appears as a lion, symbolizing his Judahite descent. The lion is interpreted explicitly as the Messiah, whom the Most High has kept until the end of days, who will arise from the offspring of David. The lion confronts an eagle, symbolizing Rome, which is further identified as the fourth beast of Daniel's vision. So if you reject using 4th Ezra because it's not scripture um, in your canon, then at least consult Daniel. The Messiah will denounce Rome for ungodliness. Then he will bring them alive before his judgment seat. And when he has reproved them, then he will destroy them. So notice that in this context of the empire, the empire will be defeated by the Messiah. And that Rome plays a special part in the messianic expectations of the Jews during the time or leading up to Jesus. Now, what I'm not saying is that what I'm saying here is that um, uh, the Eliakim typology does not necessitate, right, that it has to be in Rome. But we have good indications that the typology at least anticipates or sets up in its historical context that Rome is going to be the one with a target on its head because the Messiah is coming for him. And so given the New Testament's emphasis towards in including the Gentiles, it would make sense for the capital of the new Davidic kingdom to be in Rome rather than in Jerusalem. And I believe that my friend um, uh, Gideon Lazar is actually arguing for the further kind of primacy of Rome uh, in messianic thought. And so that, that's another thing to look at. But still, it's not surprising then that Rome would have such a place, a special place in the new Davidic kingdom. And, I'll, and you know, as a, it's a historical fact that Peter was in Rome and martyred there. Like, for example, when Peter says he's writing from Babylon in 1 Peter, everybody understood that that was a reference to Rome because Babylon had historically been to, uh, never didn't exist anymore. Um, and then even in Sean McDowell's book, The Fate of the Apostles, he also concludes it's a historical fact that Peter was martyred in Rome. And so, I mean, there are multiple lines of evidence to show that kind of this old Protestant objection that Peter was never in Rome is a myth. Um, so we seem to then have good correspondences for believing that at least Eliakim's office is a good type for the papacy. 
successional. Um, it fits within the context of a capital city, so Rome in the New Testament. Petri, in that Eliakim links to the person of Peter. Ministry, in that we have a priestly kind of connotation to Eliakim. It's supreme, given Eliakim's supreme vestiture of authority, and infallible, given that Eliakim could make, could make definitive rulings. So, of course, like, you know, more data needs to be added into the evidential calculus in order to get the specifics. But the Eliakim type sets up or anticipates much of what's in the papacy hypothesis. And so I really do think that the Eliakim typology is a significant piece of evidence for the papacy. Now, when it comes to premise seven, in terms of uh, just going now to this idea of Petrine typology, it, I've been going on for a while, but this is the second of the three reasons that I'm defending premise seven as showing that the evidence show of the, of the of the typology favors the papacy over its negation is the fact that, you know, in the Old Testament, you also do have second order typology. So when I cited Biv Benedict Viviano before, some people might say, oh, well, Swan, you're just invest in inventing a second order typology category. But actually, given the research of Scott Hahn, we do know actually in the Old Testament, there was a Moses typology applied to Joshua. And so even Joshua was played up as an anti-type to his type Moses. Even in the New Testament, we actually do have second order typology uncontroversially affirmed, such as, for instance, John the Baptist. Uh, Robinson, in his 2020 um, dissertation, he writes, quote, for example, Adam corresponds to Christ and Elijah to John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist is a kind of new Elijah. In Mark, John the Baptist's passion corresponds to that of Jesus. And then eventually, you know, John corresponds to Christ. But the point is that, yes, you do have second order typology going on in the Bible. And so the fact that we do have Petrine typology is not at all um, precluded by the nature of how typology is done. The other thing I should mention, too, is that God's typological predestination of salvation history suggests that anyone in a type-anti-type relationship bears a significant, incredible role. If Peter possesses a singular Old Testament type, then this is significant. It is a distinction that none of the other apostles can claim for themselves because the typology only applies between Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19. Now I'll get into more detail later because some people will say, what about Theodoret or what about 1818 where they seem to have the power to bind and loose. But the point is that Petrine typology is highly unexpected because we are seeing something uniquely and very, um, you, uh, very in, a, in a divine historical sense applied to Peter. There's something going on here that's incredibly significant where even Peter was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. That's pretty incredible. Moreover, the most plausible interpretation of the typology now is this. Peter naturally substitutes Eliakim and receives an office like his or authority like his, but it is filtered through the new covenant inaugurated in the person of Christ. So I remember a lot, uh, that uh, Gavin Ortland raised several objections about, okay, well, is it a typology? Okay, even if it is a typology, how does it get you to the papacy and to the doctrines and the minutiae of it? So, or, or, or what transfers over and what doesn't, otherwise known as his typology run amok argument. Now, what I want to argue is, given the natural substitution, the typology of what's going on between Peter and Eliakim, this is the most plausible interpretation that I've offered here. So to quote Willis, quote, then in his role as king, Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the authority and responsibility to bind and loose on earth what has already been bound and loosed in heaven. That is, Jesus makes Peter the major domo of his kingdom with all the privileges and responsibilities accruing to that function. So now let me answer Gavin's objections more directly on what transfers and what doesn't. So Here's what doesn't transfer over. Unlike Eliakim, Peter does not receive temporal or civil war powers, right? The reason why is not because I'm arbitrarily deciding what, what carries over and what doesn't. I'm doing the same thing that we would do with Jesus, where we decide what carries over from the old into the new through the person of Jesus Christ, who is the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, the divine son of David, and the divine king shows us what of the old kingdom transfers into the new.
right? So some people might say, oh, well, if Jesus is the king, is the son of David, where's the, where's the, where, why hasn't he, you know, claimed war on the earth? Why hasn't he defeated the kings and the nations? Where is Jesus's, I don't know, taxation policy, right? Because Israel had to collect taxes. And it's like, no, Jesus decides being the son of David, what carries over and what doesn't. And so we look to the example of the son of David to see what this new kingdom is like. And so, for example, in John 18, 36, we see that Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And what he means by that is that it's not of the world in the sense that it's not modeled to be, you know, a violent uprise against Caesar, right? Because he's dealing with this question of um, Pontius Pilate and the connotation that's given by the Jew, the Jews who have accused Jesus that he is somehow usurping the authority of Caesar and Pilate. So in that sense, then, you know, the kingdom that Jesus is bringing is an eschatological final kingdom, but it's not meant to be one that, let's say, is politically parallel, at least not yet. Acts 1, 6 to 8, Jesus is asked the question by the disciples, you know, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not time for you to know. Now, in some sense, this answer could be taken as a no. Now, it's not the, now the idea is not that Jesus is doing away with the fact that, okay, you know, he is the son of David, the house of David and the kingdom of God are coming together, or the fact that Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. But he is saying that, look, the way that I'm rebuilding David's kingdom, the way that I'm bringing the kingdom of God, it's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like, okay? It's not going to look like, you know, you know uh, what you want in terms of, let's say, the capital city of Jerusalem and a very definite geographic location you know, being the place where we have the direct divine Davidic rule of the Son of God, right? It might not have all those specifics, but definitely the kingdom of God has come and it's being channeled through the church and eventually it is a reality consummated in the eschaton. And even in fact, I believe the kingdom of God in the New Testament is described as a seed. In Ephesians uh, 6 to 12, Paul talks about how we're struggling against not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. And so in fact, we could say that Peter does not receive temporal war powers, but he does receive spiritual war powers. So we kind of maybe transition Eliakim's very earthly power into more of a kind of spiritual dimension that, of course, you know, before you have a primary emphasis on the earthly kind of over the heavenly, but now in the New Testament with the coming kingdom of God, the eschaton breaking in, the end of the ages that has come, you have a primary emphasis on the spiritual and then a secondary focus on the earth. Although I don't want to say they're subordinate. There's an important sense in which earth and heaven are together and being united by the kingdom of God, by Jesus Christ, just as in Jesus, he's fully God and fully man. So regardless, there, that's one way that you could say that the, the type doesn't transfer over exactly one for one like Eliakim. Another thing is that um, unlike Eliakim, Peter does not receive a biologically hereditary office. So I mentioned this point because Gavin mentioned it, although I know some scholars who have argued that they don't, they aren't convinced that Eliakim's office is biologically hereditary. So we'll have to look into that in more detail. Maybe um, they're wrong and Gavin's right, but you know, I'm not going to put a stake on that just yet. What I'm going to say is that even if it is the case that let's say Eliakim's office is biologically inherited, that doesn't entail that, or rather there's reasons why it's not in the case of Peter, the office that he receives is biologically hereditary. And the reason why is because the New Testament has an expansive view of what it means to be family. Like in Matthew 12, 48 to 49, when Jesus says that my brothers and sisters, my mother and my brothers and sisters are those who do the will of God. Um, even in Galatians and in Philippians, Paul has an expansive view of how we constitute a new family by being believers in God by being believers in Jesus Christ, the one whom he sent. And so we don't have to have such a biologically rigid understanding of the office. In fact, I mean, the idea of expanding to the Gentiles who might not be biological descendants of Abraham, but nonetheless can receive his blessings. I mean, that shows us then that the New Testament is going beyond just the biological or the tribal or the ethnic connections that were there before. Of course, uh, Gavin might say, oh, well, this all strikes me as arbitrary. What I'm going to say is it's not arbitrary. It's the same type of study that all scholars who discuss the continuity and discontinuity between the Old and the New Testament do. And I think we can, with reasonable arguments, show, not arbitrarily, 
but rather reasonably what transfer what transfers over and what doesn't. Any scholar who discusses the continuity and discontinuity between the Old and the New Testament is going to have to do what I'm doing right now. And I think I provided sufficiently good arguments given the theme and the idea of what the new Davidic son of David is doing, what his kingdom will look like. The second thing I want to say is that what does transfer over is the essence of the type. So, you know, if we're going to do a, a typological illusion, I believe it, I mentioned earlier that it's the nature that is transferred over of the type into the anti-type. So something that is essential in the image uh, of the text, something that's essential to that character does transfer over. So for example, Jesus being the new Moses, right? Well, Moses was a prophet who was kind of like a king, a monarch over Israel and led the people forward. Well, Jesus essentially does carry that over. The imperfections don't carry over, or if they do, they stand in an, an antithesis relationship. Or for example, Adam was the head of the old humanity. Jesus is the head of the new humanity, being a life-giving spirit. And Jesus, rather than failing like Adam, succeeds. And so that's a way in which you can have um, you know, something transfer over its essence or even its imperfections, but with an antithesis or antithetical relationship. But anyway, the point I'm making here is that, look, we should be able to identify why in the first place the biblical author identifies a typology. The why reveals to us something about the essence of the type and thereby something about the anti-type. The why is clearly discernible in the context of Isaiah and Matthew. So, for example, it's not entirely a mystery what transfers over because we understand why Matthew would invoke something like the authority of Eliakim in the book of Isaiah and Matthew, because in both contexts, we see someone receiving a great vestiture of authority. Their identity is being revealed. And so the, one of the things that you cannot miss in Isaiah 22, 22 is the supreme vestiture of authority. Likewise, in the New Testament, we see something similar happening with Peter. And so what I'm saying is, is that if the typology is intelligible, then you can identify the essence of the type. And if you can identify the essence of the type, then you can, in fact, say something minimally about what carries over. And like Eliakim, Peter receives a vestiture of great, unique, and unparalleled authority. That, I mean, that's basically what's going on with the Eliakim um, type. Eliakim receives this great authority that singles him out and makes him unique from everybody else. Peter if he's the anti-type, which I've established, if that's the case, then Peter likewise receives a great vestiture of authority. And also I, I put down C objection too, because I go into more detail on why this typology is unique to Peter um, and, and so on. So I want to now address three objections that I've heard. And these are kind of popular objections, but I'll address them again in my later video, responding to popular objections to the Peter like and typology. The first is the objection that a priori, typology cannot establish doctrine. So, you know, Swan, no matter how hard you make the case for this, uh, you know, typology, the initial probability, given the fact that typology cannot establish doctrine, and you need typology to establish doctrine in this case, because, you know, in principle, that cannot happen. No matter how much arguments you put, Swan, um, the a priori, the initial probability is just going to swamp your argument. Well, the first is that this is often asserted, but it needs to be defended, right? Like you can't just say typology cannot establish doctrine and do a hit and run and just go away once you've said it. You need to show why is it the case that typology cannot establish doctrine. The second thing is that I think this objection rests on a misunderstanding of typology. Typology does capture the literal sense of scripture. It's not just merely a spiritual sense of scripture, which is what I've heard people say is the reason why typology can't be uh, used because the fathers have referred to typology as the spiritual use of scripture. And therefore they even said that you can't use it to establish doctrine. I think there that the fathers would be mistaken if they're using typology in that way. Um, uh, because the, what we know from the original idea and intent of typology is that it is a historical, literal phenomenon that is simply recorded in Scripture. So, for example, in Mitchell L. Chase's work, 40 Questions About Typology and Allegory, he says, quote, Typological connections are not based in the literary creativity of the human authors. 
God's providential hand has truly been working within history. And so a type anti-type relationship has a transcendental origin and a historical manifestation. Now, typology typically manifests a doctrine. Like, for instance, let's say Jesus' status as lawgiver and Messiah. We see this manifested through the typology between him and Moses. So typology usually illustrates a doctrine, but I don't see how something illustrating a doctrine doesn't also mean it can't establish a doctrine. For example, if we were to debate whether or not Jesus is the Messiah, I would cite the new Moses typology to show, yeah, no, very clearly Jesus is the Messiah. And so there, that what, what was an illustration of a doctrine can also be used apologetically to establish a doctrine. So I don't see any way that this argument even makes sense. The other thing to note is in uh, Hans W. Frey's work, The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative, um, um, people will object probably like, oh, Swan, you can't use this because it's a study in 18th and 19th century hermeneutics. But Kevin G. Van Hooser in his work, um, Is There Meaning in This Text, um, page 119, uses it to describe the reality of typology itself. So even though he's saying something maybe Hans about or Frey about 18th and 19th century hermeneutics, the point is clear that he's correct on his characterization of typology. Far from being in conflict with the literal sense of the biblical stories, figuration or, or, or typology, that should be or typology, was, uh, oh, nor typology was a natural, or, or typology was a natural extension of literal interpretation. Yeah, so sorry, that, that should not say nor, it should say or. Um, it was literalism at the level of the whole biblical story and thus the depiction of the whole of historical reality. Okay, so I just want to make clear that nor there is, in, it's a typo on my part. It's meant to say or. The objection also is counterintuitive in practical application. For example, I mean, suppose Jesus used typological language to establish an office, right? So just to give a kind of silly analogy, I will give you the pen of the White House, Whatever you veto shall be vetoed. Whatever you sign shall be signed. Who wouldn't think that Jesus was establishing an office with certain powers? And so if Jesus uses typological language to establish a doctrine because he's basing it off of an Old Testament type for his New Testament kingdom, then I don't see why we couldn't say that, no, this is establishing a doctrine of sorts. To me, this objection is just simply counterintuitive in its application. Objection number two. A posteriori, there, uh, posteriori, there isn't verification beyond Matthew for this typology or its significance. And so now that I've used an establishing text in, um, just like I did, for instance, with the new Moses typology and its consequent texts, I'm now going to try to show from this establishing text of Matthew 16, 19, Isaiah 22, that you also have relevant consequence texts in the New Testament, right? So let me see what I have here. So Homer A. Kent who chastises the papacy as unscriptural because he's writing, you know, obviously from Moody Press, he's a devout Protestant. He notes the following, however. The keys symbolize authority to open. To thee relates this promise to Peter alone. It refers to the choice of Peter, as first among equals, for officially opening the kingdom, since Pentecost, including the whole sphere of Christian profession, um, to Jews and Gentiles. And so home, uh, Kent connects the keys of Peter to whenever he opened the church to the Gentiles and opened the church to even the Jews. This is the way in which we see this authority as, vis uh, as a second command or chief steward come out. And in fact, I mean, when we look at Acts 15, 7, notice what G Peter says here. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, I'm not sure what exactly Peter is referencing here when he says that he was exclusively uniquely chosen from among you, that it would be by his mouth that the Gentiles would hear the gospel and believe. But if Homer, uh, Ken Homer's, uh, if Homer A. Kent's correct here, then it could be this Matthew 16, 19 passage where he is given the keys, and then Peter understood the vestiture of the keys as a choice from among everybody else to him. Similarly, I mean, J and D Kelly points out that in the first 12 chapters or the first half of Acts, Peter is the undisputed leader of the church. Now, what kind of stuff does he do? Well, let me quote him. The first half of Acts discloses that after the ascension, though his relationship to James, the Lord's brother remains unclear, 
Peter was the undisputed leader of the youthful church. It was he who presided over the choice of a successor to Judas, who explained to the crowd the meaning of Pentecost, who healed the lame beggar at the temple, who pronounced sentence on Ananias and Sapphira, and who opened the church to Gentiles by having Cornelius baptized without undergoing circumcision. Notice that Jesus really is acting something like a chief steward or right-hand man to God or to Jesus. Same thing. He was to the foray in practicing uh, or to the fore in practicing, preaching, defending the new movement, working miracles of healing and visiting newly established Christian communities. Arrested by Herod Agrippa I, he was miraculously released from prison. At the Council of Jerusalem, he successfully championed a liberal policy towards the Gentiles. It was from Peter that Paul sought information about Jesus after his conversion. And although Paul, he felt obliged to rebuke Peter in Antioch, the context suggests the respect in which Paul held him. Although Paul describes his ministry as directed to Jews, Peter was also prominent as a missionary and largely Gentile. Uh, uh, yeah, he, Paul describes Peter's ministry as directed to Jews. Peter was also prominent as a missionary in largely Gentile areas like Corinth and Asia Minor. Early tradition, perhaps relying on the visit mentioned in Galatians, connected him with Antioch, claiming him as its first bishop. So all this is to say is that we do see, I think, further confirmation in the book of Acts that Peter is this kind of second in command to the king, uh, chief steward, and really is uniquely selected from the rest with this mission to have the keys and open the church to the Gentiles, but even to the Jews. Um, uh, so let me continue on here. Um, now, here's the third and final objection that I'll encounter, and it's the objection that the other disciples possess the keys. So here's what da uh, W.D. Davies and Dale Allison say in their commentary, um, uh, their, their well-known commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, volume 2, page 635. Quote, If possession of the keys means the power to bind and loose, then one may urge that Peter is promised no more than the other disciples. For in 1818, the power to bind and loose is clearly held by others. But in verse 19a, it is broader in scope. Then one can make the case that for Peter having a unique function, and they cite Vatican II. In our estimation, it is most natural to think of verse 19a as being explicated by what follows. To have the keys is to have the power to bind and loose, which would mean vice versa, to have the power to bind and loose is to have the keys. Further, 19a and verses 19b to c probably have to do with teaching authority. For binding and loosing as metaphors or for halakhic decisions, see below. We do, however, still insist that Peter is not thereby put on the same level as his fellow disciples. It remains true that only he is explicitly said to have the keys. More significantly, verse 19 cannot be isolated from verses 17 and 18. And in these last, Peter is spoken of in terms not, apl not applicable to anyone else. Also, it should not be overlooked that whereas 1818 concerns the local community or assembly, 1619 is about the church universal. Hence, the authority bestowed in 1619 is implicitly wider than what is given. That is given as 1818. For these reasons, then, we are not persuaded that the existence of 1818, with its more general promise of the authority to bind and loose, diminishes Peter's prominence. If the power to bind and loose was also given to others, that does not entail that those others exercise their power in quite the same way as Peter, or that they too held the keys of the kingdom. Um, now, on that last part where they say, or that they too held the keys of the kingdom, it could be read as a contradiction um, because they do say that if you have the keys, uh, to have the keys is the power to bind and loose, and so you could do the vice versa that I just did. I think what they meant to say was that it doesn't mean that they held the keys in the same way as Peter. Regardless, I do want to point out that this is these are two Protestant leading uh, Protestant New Testament scholars, although W.D. Davies is deceased, Allison is still alive. Um, and what they're making the argument here is that, no, they, don't, they aren't convinced that just because 1818 exists, that means that Peter is thereby, like kind of the promise given to Peter is sort of nuanced and flattened to everybody. Um, the other thing that I should mention, too, is that I've written you know, an article in Catholic Answers talking about, I think what uh, they titled it, what Protestants don't understand about binding and loosing, where I say that simply because you have 1818 and 1619, there are multiple ways to interpret the relationship between Peter's unique binding and loosing and the apostles with Peter's binding and loosing. So you can't just automatically affirm, um, you know, de facto, right? That, oh, this means that everything was flattened out and Peter's thing is nuanced. 
I mean, scholars would actually argue, like Ulrich Luz in his book Studies in Matthew, that actually what Matthew is saying here is that all the powers of the apostles were concentrated, could be concentrated in the one person of Peter in 1619. So he actually re reads it in a reverse order. That's also a possibility. And I'm saying that you can't just simply say de facto because you see um, 1619 and 1818 um, in this successive order. That means that 1818 somehow flattens 1619. I don't think that's the case at all. Or it doesn't follow. It needs further argumentation. Um, the other thing that I should like to mention is that recently there have been arguments made that maybe Paul is a better candidate or um, Paul is something more like a pope or um, – Paul shows that Peter didn't really have any unique kind of infallible supreme authority. I mean, my response to that, and I've given this in more detail in Trent Horn's channel, is that I think that Paul and the apostles could teach universally and infallibly, much like the Bishop of Rome or the Pope or like Peter, in the sense that um, in the sense that the apostles were uniquely selected by Christ and were therefore the chief guardians of the apostolic deposit. And insofar as the apostolic deposit is the universal rule of faith, and the apostles were, you know, giving the apostolic deposit, then Paul and the others could teach universally and infallibly, right? Because they were, you know, in the unique office of apostle and going to the uni universal infallible rule of faith, which is the apostolic deposit. At the same time, um, uh, wh what I have argued is that P Paul has that qua apostle, whereas Peter's vestiture of authority and what the is, 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 you know, Peter has the authority as an apostle to also be a chief guardian of the apostolic deposit. But Peter has a double vestiture of also being the guardian of the guardians, as we see in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, where we see that Peter is commanded by Christ uh, or urged by Christ to protect the other apostles, despite the fact that Satan is coming after all of them. Um, and then even we see in Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel that when the disciples fall asleep, who does Jesus blame? He blames Peter because he viewed Peter as the elder brother of the apostles. He doesn't blame the apostles. He blames Peter when he sees all the apostles falling asleep. Or moreover, um, uh, I'm trying to think about another example that I was trying to use, but I think it's kind of left me. Um, so what I'm saying here is that Peter does can teach like an apostle with universal infallible authority qua apostle by virtue of being apostle. Oh, oh, I, was, I remember what I was going to say before. So you just as, for instance, Jesus blames the apostles, uh, blames Peter when the apostles fall asleep, who does Jesus explicitly forgive? In John 21, 15 and 19, he forgives Peter. And in a sense, even though all the other disciples fell away, except John, he comes back. It is actually, I think, what, reveal, what the scriptures reveal is that it is through Peter that the other apostles were also forgiven because he was their chief representative, caretaker, and elder brother. And so in that context, then, we see the relationship between Peter and the other apostles. It was the relationship of an elder brother. Now, the thing that I want to point out is that an elder brother sometimes will look indistinguishable from his brothers, right? There'll be times where it'd be more egalitarian, but there will be times where an elder brother will assert his authority if he has been given to it by, let's say, your, you know, your dad and dad leaves and keeps the elder brother in charge, where the other elder brother can assert his authority as elder brother over the younger brothers. And so here, I think that's the best way to understand the papacy, not only in the New Testament, but also throughout history, where you don't see all the time the pope acting like a dictator, because that's not what the papacy is. The dictator is an elder, excuse me, the papacy is an elder brother who can guide his brothers. He sometimes looks more equal to them. Other times he has to assert objectively the authority given to him by God the Father through God the Son with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's how you can make sense of the history of the church because the Pope is an elder brother, just as Peter was an elder brother. You can have egalitarian and hierarchical dimensions to that elder brother relationship. Um, now, so going back to then Peter and Paul, what I want to say is that Peter and Paul were similar and that qua apostle, they both could teach universally and infallibly. But what I'm saying is, is that in the case of Matthew 16, 19, Jesus institutes in Peter, qua Peter, in Peter, the person himself, this unique vestiture of connection back to Isaiah 22, 22, of Peter being a new Eliakim. And if that's the case, and notice what we've taught throughout, what the Catholic Church has taught throughout history. When the Pope declares something ex cathedra, or when the Pope speaks definitively, such as in the case of Pope Leo the Great and the case of Pope Agatho, um, 
Peter speaks. He's not speaking as, well, he is speaking as a successor of the apostle, but he doubly, uniquely speaks as Peter. And it's because the, the Petrine office, the office of the Pope, is based in the person of Peter. Peter has a double role also as an apostle, and in that way there might be some similarities between him and the other apostles. But Peter, qua Peter, Peter in virtue of being Peter, has a unique endowment that was given to him by Christ as well. Peter is not only the chief guardian, along with the other apostles, of the universal deposit of the faith. Peter is also the chief guardian of the guardians. Another objection, Oh, so, so continuing on to this last objection, I mean, what we can establish is that Isaiah 22 applies to Matthew 16, 19, and not 18, 18. And the reason why is because binding and loosing may be understood as substituting opening and shutting only if the keys are present, because it is primarily these two together, among other factors, that establish the illusion back to Isaiah 22, 22. So on its own, if Jesus just said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, in Jewish thought, this was already understood without necessarily entailing the reality of a key. And so it would not be possible then to extract from just 1818 alone the Isaiah 22, 22 typology. But it is with 1619 of both the keys and the power to bind and loose that you get the allusion back to Isaiah 22. The keys being the same of the house of David, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then you have binding and loosing, opening and shutting. Moreover, the unique vestiture of power to uh, of Eliakim more naturally latches onto one person whenever it is used. And so we can even say that the reason why Isaiah 22 applies to 1619 and not 1818 is that it naturally applies to usually one person. So in the case of Isaiah 22, 22 is Eliakim, Revelation 3, 7, it's in the case of Jesus himself. The other thing I want to mention is that, in fact, one could argue that the disciples obtained the keys through Peter in a sense. For example, we need Peter's explicit possession of the keys in order to infer possession of them by the, the whole apostolate in 1818, right? And this was, in fact, the position of St. Thomas Aquinas in his commentary in the Gospel of Matthew, that the disciples have the keys through Peter. And I would, in fact, argue that if Peter in Acts 15, 7 understood himself as being the one chosen from among you to open the church to the Gentiles, and he was thinking of Matthew 16, 19, and what was said to him by Christ, then Peter himself understood this vestiture of him having the keys as something unique and to himself. Now, the other apostles could participate through their binding and loosing power by being in communion with Peter and agreeing with his ruling which we see in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in Acts 15, 7, where Peter is the main one who pioneers the ruling on the Gentiles after there had been much debate. He gives this definitive ruling. Paul and Barnabas are mentioned afterwards, but their speeches are not recorded by Luke. And then James, when he gives his final ruling as the Bishop of Jerusalem, he uses Peter's words, Simeon's words, as the foundation for his ruling. So notice that Peter is once again acting like that elder brother. It is his vestiture that is the blueprint and foundation for the rest of the church and in guiding them to the proper rulings on doctrine concerning faith and morals. And so here I just want to now say that the argument that, I want, that, that I've established is that there is a textual illusion between Isaiah 22 and Matthew 16, 19. There is a Peter Eliakim typology. And I think that this naturally fits with the person of Peter, uh, or rather with the office of the papacy. Now, I actually looked down momentarily in the comment section. I saw someone say, um, I saw some, so I saw uh, someone say, didn't this discussion already occur with Ubi Petrus? The thing is, I've updated my arguments since my time with Ubi Petrus, and I think I've effectively shown that they're no longer, at least Ubi's objections have been effectively, I think, dealt with throughout this presentation. The second is that Peter established other patriarchates as well. That is true. But I wonder if this person missed my point about Rome being unique, unique in messianic expectations of the Jews concerning what kind of kingdom the Messiah would bring and take over as the son of David. The Jews believed, especially in Daniel, that the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom to be conquered by the Messiah was specifically going to be Rome. And so I don't take seriously anybody who calls me a papist and says I'm in utter delusion. Now, I do apologize for my kind of terse tone there, and the reason why is because I just want to say in, in closing, you know, Catholics, do not allow yourself to be dismissed 
Do not allow yourself to be mocked. Do not allow yourself to be treated second class, okay? To the Catholics who are watching, I have poured hours of research into this presentation. I have spoken for four hours. I could keep going if I had more arguments. and Well, I do have more arguments and more things to say. But the point that I want to say to you is do not be ashamed of the Catholic Church. Do not be ashamed of the great gift that Christ has given to us. Christ in the person of Peter gave us the prime ministerial office. Christ instituted his new divine Davidic kingdom in with the capital city of Rome being that center point. Guys, we live in the new Davidic kingdom, and it will be further consummated in the eschaton when the kingdom of God reaches its full and final perfect span of the earth and the cosmos. And so when people ask, you know, why is the church so institutional? When people say they don't like organized religion, what I want to say is the church is organized and institutional because it is a kingdom. And we should not be afraid of what happens with the Roman pontiff and the church. I am not worried. I'm not scared because one is that I've given my entire life to the church. I'm entering the Dominican order. I love the church and I love all of you. And I want to give my life and service to God's body, to Christ's church, to Christ's body. And so as I've done all this research, as I've done the hard work, as I've looked at the Protestant and the Catholic scholarship on this issue, and even the Orthodox scholarship, as I've looked further and further, I want to say to the Catholics, do not be afraid. Christ has his kingdom under control. And that we today as Catholics, we live with the, you know, the, the, the Davidic prime minister in Rome. You know, Jesus really did conquer Rome. The, the Pharisees aren't in power anymore. The Sadducees aren't in power anymore. Caesar is not in power anymore. No, in Rome, who's seated on the throne of authority? It's the Davidic prime minister. And so I want to say to all of you, you know, thank you for the ways in which you have supported me. And I want you to know that, you know, especially for the Catholics who I've reached uh, and talked to, you know, do not be ashamed of the church. I believe that this, the church is worth giving all of my life to, and I've given so much of my life to it already in the research that I've done. And so do not be afraid. Pick up a Bible commentary, read the scriptures, read the church fathers, glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and also go pray for the Bishop of Rome, pray for the Holy Father, do a rosary for him, because we need to keep him in our prayers. Not because he's going to fall apart or Rome's going to fall apart. No, it's because he has a difficult job. But as a successor of Peter, even though, you know, our first pope kind of bumbled and messed up a little bit, Jesus saw in Peter more than what Peter could have imagined. Jesus saw in Peter a prime minister. And Jesus sees in you a royal son and daughter. Let us rejoice that we are in the new Davidic kingdom.